Tell us the best evidence for evolution. Well, I'll just I'll just highlight two of the areas that I would consider the best evidence. There's others like embryology or biogeography, but by far the most compelling evidence for evolution, in my estimate, is genetic similarities. Right. I mean, especially genetic similarities in non-conserved, non-functional regions. I don't see how there's any other possible explanation for that other than just God or the devil just playing a big trick on us and making it look like evolution is real. Um, and then also the the fossil record, of course, both the ordering of the fossils we find separated out into different layers based on species, not based on anything else that could be sorted in any other way. Um, and then our ability to predict fossil anatomies before they're discovered using evolution. So is, is, record and okay. Genetics. Okay, so is is anatomy phenotype or genotype? Uh, phenotype. Okay, uh, can you have similar phenotypes and not the same genes? Yeah. Okay, so then if you're finding a bunch of fossils and it matches anatomically and phenotypically, and you jump to their related genetically, is that a is that a logical leap or not? Uh, you don't necessarily need to make that leap that they're all related genetically. All that needs to be said is that you can predict what their anatomies are before they're discovered using evolution to make your prediction. Hold on. I know, but the question is, if anatomy and, and phenotype doesn't imply shared genotype, I'm saying when you find something ana uh, anatomically similar, they could be two different species, correct? Sure, of course. So, like you, so then how do you... It's called instances of convergent evolution, where they might have similar anatomies, but be com from completely different lineages. Okay, so are you saying they're still genetically related? Or, or are, you, are you assuming they're genetically related as no. long as they have anatomical similarities? No, you don't need to make any assumptions about their genetic relations. All you need to see is what is their actual anatomy, and can you predict anatomies beforehand? It, I mean... It, basically, it's like a statistical impossibility that we'd be able to keep on predicting the anatomy okay. we find in fossils. Okay, so evolution is not true. I'm going to use an example. Um, Eva already heard the camel camel world, but I'm going to change it to dolphin dolphin world. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you knew what dolphins were, right? You had access to their current biology, genetics, and their bone structure, anatomy, phenotype. Uh -huh. um, you studied them, and then you you thought, well. What if it was the case that um, some form of of this um, this species or this animal, right? Some form of it branched off and eventually went on land. Let's just say you just posited it as some sort of hypothetical. You were like, "Ah, oh, cool," um, and you didn't know what like a uh, like a lamb was, but you you dug up a lamb and and you thought that this the skeleton of the lamb and the skull and the shape of the lamb was eerily similar to the dolphin. Now, if you didn't know what a lamb was, would you assume relatedness? No, but again, the, the lamb's not anatomically similar to a dolphin. But if you were going to say that you had some theory that allowed you to predict what a lamb's exact anatomical features were going to be before it was discovered, and then you discovered fossils of the lamb exactly where you predicted, Mm. then yeah i would absolutely be interested in what mechanistically was allowing you to make that prediction because that lends credence to your prediction but the thing is it's not a very good example because the lamb does not have anatomy that you could predict based on dolphin evolution the problem is they don't grant the coherence of the theory so they don't grant that you can make that prediction but that that's my take on it well they, they i mean they have to predict they have to acknowledge that you can make that prediction because those predictions were made in recorded history beforehand Sure, sure, but but ultimately the critique is not like okay, you can look at homologous structures. Like, do homologous structures exist? That's not the critique. The critique is mm -hmm. you actually can't make the prediction itself. That's why I made the premises. I, I still disagree I really on, on moving on to this. To be honest, you're arguing for them, and you're not even making the same arguments that they would be making right now. Like, well, I, well, well, we could use we could use Camel World. We could use Camel World too, where it's a little more on the nose, right? If, if you're saying that, um, you know you knew of camels, right? And uh, you saw them on land and then you thought, well, you, you found something, you dug something up and it was similar to a camel, but it wasn't identical. And you thought, well, what if this animal is like, you know, a previous version uh, of the camel, in, you know, in its, right. in its, can I stop you there just to clarify something real quick? We're not talking about like post hoc, like 
like after you dig something up, then you're ra- reasoning based on its anatomy that's transitional. We're talking about predicting it. Yeah. Before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Fine. I'll change. I'll I'll uh, correct the okay. hypothetical. So you know what camels are, and you think in your head, what if there was a predicted previous version of this camel that was maybe smaller, very similar, uh, different enough, but similar enough. And you thought, oh, I'm gonna, let's find, let's predict it. So you dig it up and you actually find what, you, lo and behold, you okay. thought, it, you know, you found this thing, right? It's a smaller version or whatever. Now, now I always use, uh, you know, over in Peru, there's a tribe that digs up uh, things. They're, they're just gardening and stuff. And they find the same exact fossil you just found, not the identical, but the same um, species, so to speak. And um, they're, they're laughing and giggling and the, you know, someone comes over and goes, oh, look, a, you know, a llama, mm-hmm. right? They just say it's a llama because they know what a llama is. But in your situation, you only know what a camel is. Now, you predicted you would unveil in the ground uh, something, a predictive anatomical similar uh phenotypically similar animal that you assume is the past but you you don't know that this animal's already known and i'm asking you what's the methodology when you say that's a transitional fossil let's say right uh-huh. let's say you called it that by name just by discovering because it, it was predictive right you use evolution yeah, to yeah. go back in time and predict something well is the prediction correct or incorrect knowing that these animals still actually exist somewhere you, you just don't know. Um, that doesn't really affect it, the predictive anatomy at all. But I, I'll clarify for this example, right? So first of all, if somebody actually did this and had predicted llamas before they were dis- before they knew about them and predicted what exact their anatomical features should be beforehand, I would certainly be interested in their methodology. And if they could do that, not just one time, not just a one-off, like getting lucky, but over and over and over again, multiple times, they were predicting things that were not known beforehand. I would be very interested in their, their methodology and I would say, hey, maybe there's something going on here because this is this is, cannot be just a coincidence that they're able to keep on predicting these fossils. But these but, what I, but but the hypothetical the purpose of the hypothetical That's is the point deter- of world, determining you don't have that methodology in. Camel yeah. World. The, yeah. The methodology in this this hypothetical, you don't have I, if I asked you what methodology are you using to determine whether in, in fact you did find a predictive um, a predicted previously existing transitional uh, animal right or they just existed at, at different times but they could have just as well existed at the same time and not been the sure. same animal. And so i can give you an example of like transitional anatomy between two animals that still exist like it just because you have like w- when when a branch diverges here right and you and you have you can have different populations with transitional anatomy still persisting to the present and they still have those transitional anatomical features. Like a better example for you to use in the future, rather than just llamas and camels, would be like seahorses and pipefish. Like because in evolution, seahorses evolved from something very similar to a pipefish. They the pipefish has transitional anatomical features on the way to a seahorse, but that doesn't mean that it, its That's population c- cannot. Con- no, no, you don't understand. That you're begging the question. You're assuming the thing is transitional. I'm saying. How, what methodology would you use in the camel world example to determine whether it was transitional or you just happened to find something that coexisted? It just, it just, it's a, there, it exists during is, this. My point is, is that creatures with transitional anatomy can coexist with like more derived creatures. That that's that, that there's nothing wrong with that. Like a population of coelacanth, which has transitional anatomy, can still persist to the present day. Like it. it this doesn't mean that just because something has transitional features means that it it, it had to have died off and can't live to the present. No, day. I'm I, Grayson. To use the term transitional features is mm-hmm. to assume an event is happening, right? That you can't observe. No. So what I'm asking you, what does it mean then? That. It's just a label. If you want to change it to just say intermediate anatomy, I don't care what you call it. Like the, what about what about what about honest? What about just be honest and say it's similar? Why why is it so it's hard to say it's similar? similar. It's not just okay. similar. Like, what is have, it then? You have species A and species B, right? And you, and you don't know about any species C that's in between. And you use evolution to say, hey, these are very genetically similar species. We would predict that they would have a common ancestor. And we should be able to find fossils that have intermediate anatomy between them, the, these two. So if one has a, a certain feature at 100%, one has them okay. at zero, you predict something to have that feature at 50%. Yeah, but but you 
but you're going back to anatomy and phenotype to be to be related to gen genetics. No, it that's just what informs your prediction. You're predicting the existence of the anatomy itself. You're not predicting any genetic aspect of it. You're just predicting the existence of anatomy with that transitional intermediate quality to it. Similar but different. Intermediate. Yeah, sure. I mean it's 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 going to be intermediate between two endpoints. Yeah, but again, it's just like when you say it's it's like smuggling in what you're calling the thing to fit what you're assuming is occurring, right? By saying transitional or even intermediate assumes that there's point A to point B as a process, right? And we're saying, well, if it's the case that I can give it a hypothetical where you actually can't assume that there is a process, that you're just seeing similar versus, versus dissimilar and some somewhere in between. And so that, that ends up being the question, the methodology, such that you can smuggle in the word okay. intermediate, which so assumes be point A, point B, or transitional, you, which assumes A and B, right? If you don't like the word transitional or intermediate, I'm open to you proposing any kind of word that you want to use to describe it. But the point is, is that we can predict anatomy before it's discovered, and we're using evolution to form that prediction. The, the, whenever... You're talking about how there ha assumes that there's some process that happened. That's just what allows you to make the prediction in the first place. Then you need to find the evidence that matches that prediction in the fossil record. So you're not, whenever you're finding that fossil with the predicted anatomy, you're not assuming that it was this exact ancestral transition or whatever. It just matches the anatomy that you predicted using evolution. Posh, do you have anything to say on this? We can move on to another uh, point of evidence that's claimed. Yeah, this is this is rather dead end. I think Evo Colossus understood why. Uh, base theory sort of just went with the assumption rather than picking the assumption, and that's it's not about what we call it. It's um, okay. Uh, so you have, let's say, like, like the in the debate we had with uh, uh, Gary Epi and. and mm -hmm. The other guy, I'm not sure if we can mention him. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, so, like the the heart example that I gave, you know, uh, that you have you've got the four chambers in like mammals and stuff, and then you've got uh, the uh, two chambered heart. It's not called that. I can't remember what it's called in English, but with like simpler life forms. And then you're going to have to transition between them. The problem being that uh, the smallest uh, changes can be very catastrophic if you're going to through this incremental uh, phase and someone brought up there's a turtle with like a like a uh, this divider between the, the the lower chamber uh, uh that is halfway like between a three chambered and a four chambered heart um and i said yes th this was in practice right it's it wasn't a theoretical uh, example that we were giving uh and they say, okay, so this is the intermediary, but we're saying, no, this is what this turtle has. You have to show that it ha uh, ha that its ancestors had the, uh, the clear, clear one, and then its descendants have the full one, right? That's how uh, you go with these things. I understand the point you're trying to make, base theory, because you're trying to go with predictive modeling, but uh, a lot of predictive modeling can be very wrong with if the assumptions are correct then there's more fidelity in the outcome but uh, 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 as i was mentioning earlier on uh, you have pragmatic problems uh, you have problems of okay we're going through this thought process but if you're going to have to have a highly dysfunctional circulatory system uh, you're that's not just uh, something you can overcome with either mathematics or anything because it, 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 this um, entity needs to survive. It I, I needs agree. to have offspring. I agree. Every okay. step along the way needs to, like, every change along the way needs to endow a certain fitness benefit. Like, I, I'm not saying you ever get to a part where you're less beneficial so that you can get something more beneficial down the line. Every step along the way increases fitness benefit. And we can go through the whole irreducibly complex thing, but just on, I want to ask you a, a quick follow-up question, Polish, on what I'm talking about with predicting transitional anatomies in the fossil record. 
would you consider this to be just a coincidence that we're just we happen to be able to use evolution to predict stuff like Archaeopteryx or Australopithecus or like something like Tiktaalik was not just predicted what anatomy it should have, but it was predicted exactly where they should find a creature with that anatomy down to the, the layer that it was predicted to be found in. I mean, are those all just coincidences that I mean, we're using evolution to make predictions that come true? Uh, I wouldn't argue that it's uh, either because, first of all, I, I have a very skeptical approach to those things. If you've studied the problems and how much uh, money is made off of those things and how many things were retracted in the same uh, uh, same regard. Um, but uh, so I would question that. But if, uh, again, I was to grant you that we found everything as you described it, um, then I understand how that is pointing towards your worldview. That uh, again, I, I understand where you're coming from. The point is, uh, the underlying assumptions are problematic. And when uh, when I said you need this step by step, uh, you know, evolution in the sense of it doesn't even need to be a direct benefit. But I'm saying uh, in certain uh, trajectories that were taken, like even with this uh, increase of the size of the animal. At some point, you're going to have mechanical problems. We also brought up the giraffes, etc. You know, it's not just a bigger thing. And, you know, big thing, good. You know, it, it's stronger, it is uh, more fearsome. Uh, so it can just with uh, uh, serve as merely an int intimidation factor. Uh, but you're going to arrive at uh, mechanical problems with the giraffe. That's obviously, you know, it has to drink water. And, you know, with having its brain so far up yeah. uh, as opposed to its heart, you're going to need a heart to compensate for it. Yeah. But then you're going to get into anatomical problems of, sorry? So this is something I think we can actually discuss. Would you be able to describe okay. what some of these mechanical problems are with every step of the way to the four chambered heart? Because I would just say that once it's a problem, it's selected out of the population. Yeah, I understand that. Well, that's but, not ex exactly but, what I'm asking. Um, it's not what he is asking. Uh, but uh, as I said, if you're going to start developing something that's uh, similar to, um, sorry, my English is falling f short on this one, um, uh, 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 like the problem with the heart, uh, the chamber, uh, uh, it starts. You you start developing like um, this tissue and it decreases the functionality of it. Uh, do any of you know the name for that in English? The what, say that again? The process of yeah. what? Uh, so you get uh, the accumulation of this type of uh, 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 tissue on, on on the chamber of your heart and it decreases its uh, volume and causes problem. Uh, uh, never mind. Black? Catheter? Or arterial no. plaque? A, st a stint? No. Uh, the no process? Uh, 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 let's, let's get back into it so the problem is you're decreasing the 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 uh, volume of the <laughs> heart so cholesterol yeah. um uh, so you're getting the problem of... it's Sorry. called smoking I and easily i'm very distracted. Well Sorry. <laughs> okay go ahead Bosch. okay so uh evil colossus as i said uh, if you talk to people who are like medical doctors and stuff they can tell you how quickly uh, uh, how easily uh, uh, any changes in the anatomy of the heart causes problems, you know. Um, a decrease in a chamber of about 20% can cause you to be almost uh, immobile as far as how quickly you would get tired and oxygenation becomes a problem. You know, pe people like this have problems getting up a flight of stairs, you know. Yeah, so right. the, the problem with this is it assumes you have a human with a modern human lifestyle, right? If you have a smaller heart, then you can do a lifestyle for a simpler, less aerobically taxing lifestyle of something other than a human. So so this is kind of the problem, the, the problem of a reduced heart or whatever. That's assuming you already have a human and just the heart is like falling behind, but that's not what's happening. Does that make sense? Uh, well, uh, as someone who does have a smaller heart, <laughs> which I've been told I had to go in checkups for pressure problems, um, but uh, actually the cardiologist said that was a, actually a good thing. Uh, I, I'm talking like the heart in general. Well, the bigger the heart is actually the heart, going to. It's how you use it. 
Uh, no, I, are you trying to be poetical <laughs> or serious? I'm making a joke. Okay, okay. So, no. <laughs> so Evo's saying that that the heart, the function of the heart, could could be um, a, a bigger consistent. heart is more of a right. problem than a smaller heart. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying well, if right. you're we're talking about the giraffe, if you're going to have increases, that is more problems than can, a, a benefit. Okay. If Go I ahead. can maybe articulate what you're saying. So you brought up the turtle that has this like three and a half chambered heart, right? It has like the fourth chamber is septated, so it's not completed. And the problem is, okay, well, if a human has this heart, that's going to cause a lot of problems possibly. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not my point. I'm, I'm okay. not saying a human gets a, a transplant from a turtle. Um, <clears throat> I'm saying that if you're going to have this population of humans, let's say, and they start developing something within their heart uh, that is going to maybe somewhere down the line develop into a more advanced heart. Um, the, the, the system is not very tolerant of these anatomical changes, which is why I brought up the human problem if you have like one chamber that is uh, slightly weaker. Um, uh, because that's, that's, again, a small problem uh, as compared to like developing the ventricle. Um, because I'm saying if that turtle is a healthy functioning turtle and then you're going in the direction of developing this thing, this uh, four chambered heart, uh, sorry, I said ventricle, I meant interventricular uh, septum, uh, you're going to uh, cause problems for the population until it uh, achieves an, uh, the next stage uh, of the properly operating circulatory systems. That's I'm saying, how evolution works. Um, I, I'm saying that if you're, uh, I understand you're going to say populations. That's no, that's no, no. A that's not what I, I mean, every step along the way is going to increase fitness. Okay. Okay, but here's the thing. Yeah. Just saying that and demonstrating what would need to be the case, like Pasha saying, I I usually use a more rhetorically funny approach, which is when asexual started its sexual process of growing a one-eighth penis, right? How long did this nub, um, how long did the nubby, nubby. Um, exist before it grew? Now, the, well, the, the statement is that. from, right, hold on. The statement is that even the nub itself, undeveloped, somehow pr presented some, yeah. some valuable asset, right? So what is it? It does, it does yeah. Well, I want to stick what? to the heart thing. I'm not ready to, to move on from that because there you are don't want to talk about dicks. What, well, hey, we can I'll get there. We can, we can get there. But the okay, fine, fine. Yeah, fine. Like Go the back to the heart. Conversation's not done um, because there there are a few assumptions about like growing a heart. And the thing is, if you go back to the turtle example that has the septated ventricle or whatever. Um, there's um, variation in the size of the septum, right? So there's differences in like how complete, so-called complete, the septum is within the turtle. And we have that the more septated it is, so the, the closer it is to being closed, the more aerobically efficient it is. So I don't buy, the, I don't grant this assumption that increasing the septum is actually detrimental to the turtle. Okay. Uh, then we can move on to the giraffe part, if you'd like. So what would you say there? Because increasing the size of the heart is uh, not beneficial. Uh, in fact, it's a big problem for very tall people. Well, people Could a giraffe aren't... survive with a smaller heart? What do you mean survive? Would with a smaller, smaller heart, heart be able to pump blood all the way up its neck to its head? Uh, as we're talking about the increases, then uh, you would have a problem. It's going to be as small as possible. But as you have the increases, it's going to have to start developing uh, the heart bigger and get, uh, the heart needs to become bigger and bigger mm -hmm. to achieve it. Yep. Right. So you can't just maintain a very small heart with a very tall person. They wouldn't be able to do quite a lot. Yep. Um, but then you're going to start developing a, a, and giraffes have these these um, valves they're not valve like uh, growths that allow for uh, the the blood not to uh, flow too quickly or too slowly depending on whether its head is raised or lowered do you get the the point yeah, it, so it needs like to be brain. powerful enough to pump uh, up the heart mm -hmm. uh, up uh, the neck or to the brain yeah. but if you lower your uh, head, 
Yeah. The giraffe lowers its head. Now it's not working against the pull of gravity. It's now working with it. So you I need think. this compensatory mechanism in it's order to allow plan. for the smooth flow. Yeah. I think this is making assumptions about the aerobic demands of the lifestyle of the giraffe and also of the lifespan of the giraffe. How so? Well, so like problems with big hearted people is they don't live very, very long, right? It doesn't um, matter. Yeah, people... giraffe, it's like, 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 like giraffes aren't as active as a human and giraffes also don't live as long as a human. Okay. Uh, this is why I brought up also the fact that anatomically they would have demands for the uh, as i said compensatory mechanisms you need to have these things develop uh if you want to have a giraffe be able to lower its head uh, and raise it again without just collapsing because that is enough of a uh, of a stress you know if you get up a bit too quickly that can be a problem uh, when you have these disturbances in uh, how quickly blood flows you need compensation for it it's not like a horse drinking water because there's not nearly enough of a change <clears throat> in uh, the amount of uh, pressure that is being, uh, that is Gosh. involved. Then you right. would accept then that as the giraffe neck is elongating over its species history, there's a certain point where it's not long enough for it to be detrimental, but it is long enough for it to cause beneficial effects. And you could start having selective pressures for those kind of compensatory mechanisms that you're talking about, where it's not necessarily that lacking those things is going to result in any harm or death for this giraffe that has an intermediate length neck. Uh, as far as I understand, the benefit of the neck is mostly reproductive, uh, not as in mechanically, uh, but as far as selection, you know, uh, uh, giraffes tend the bulls. That would make the selective to... pressure even greater, by the way. Yes, and it would also increase it. I'm, I'm not saying that it wouldn't uh, go in that direction. I'm saying uh, then you need the compensatory mechanism if you're going to achieve the uh, the anatomy but, of the giraffe. Yeah, the question is the valve itself, the thing that stops the blood from flowing when it lowers his neck, right? You guys are saying that every step along the way as the neck as the neck was shorter and the they begin to use it as like like a um, a battle weapon right that uh evo colossus is saying that would uh create more selective pressure to grow the neck strengthen the neck maybe elongate the neck and pasha saying in what point in this in this process did 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 it produce a valve that that would um that would be there before the problem of the blood flow and you're saying it all happens at once which, uh, which is People ironically, well, then, then, then it, is the valve there when it's not necessary to be there? It depends the, on what the, the valve, valve can give a minor produced. advantage, even if it's not as long as it is now. Like if it's just a little bit long, you can have a valve. There's no reason that this can't happen. Is there any time where it doesn't have a valve? Is my question. Do you know what anatomical feature it's proposed that? Hold on, the valve hold on. I asked the question. I had a, I had a question. I know, is but there it's any entirely relevant. To hold on, base. I, I'm asking Evo a question. Is there any time in the in the theory in the the narrative of evolution where there is no valve? Sure. Okay. So the question uh, that Posh is still raising, he's just being more deliberate with contrasting the finished item called a giraffe with what it has, and asking where in this process does it develop. We're asking there is there's a moment where a giraffe's not a giraffe we think it is today. But yet it has this valve for what purpose at the time, right? What is it? Well, is anybody here familiar with what the valve was proposed to have evolved from? What anatomical feature it evolved from? Because it just pop out of the out of nowhere. It evolved. It has to. Well, it ha well, whatever it came from needed also some preceding um, functionality, you know, yes. thing. That so is it's like the to, question further though. We have to grant the premise that the pre-existing thing exists in order to ascertain that the valve can evolve from the, that pre-existing thing so we have to grant yeah, that but, uh, yeah but yeah but so okay so but this is the problem with evolution is that you guys grant yourself a bunch of things including starting with populations with which was one of my main arguments that evolution oh. can account for populations it oh. needs populations hold on and if you keep going back right you guys go well no i'm not going to do abiogenesis fine the, the evolutionary theory still has to present a case for how you go from these arbitrary points back in time to now 
um, using a mechanistic explanation, right? Not just an assumption of explanation, yeah, a mechanistic. So the reason I'm going back in the in the giraffe's life span, back, 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 even if Basin says, well, do you know that mechanism came from this other thing, right? Why, why wouldn't it be valid that we keep going back if you're saying this is on this one continuous time? It's a one continuous so, timeline, though. Well, because you grant the premise in the question, and then when we answer the question, you take back the premise, right? Like we can do this ad infinitum, we can keep going, but at what point are we going to admit that each step of the way is coherent? That's the question. Like, there's a really good example. Uh, Posh brought up Behe before, and like Behe is famous for saying that the mouse trap could not evolve because if you take one piece away, it no longer functions as a mouse trap. And he was doing a debate, and the pr professor walked in. And he had a mouse, uh, a mouse trap that he had removed a piece from and was using it as a clip for his tie. And the point was, is that these things can change functions over time. It doesn't have to be functioning as a mouse trap. These valves could have had a previous function. And like until you guys pro say like what it is even proposed to have evolved from, then like I don't know these giraffe va valves. I can't speculate about it. But like how do you, like. The point is, is that you can have the function that was different than the function, the novel functionality that was evolved with a minor tweak. Right. I'm saying that even if we granted some different function, what Pasha is saying is that the process between its current function and its current organism to the future function of the, in this case, a giraffe, right? If we're talking about just the valve, <clears throat> you're also saying at the same time that everything else happening in the organism is also fully functional on its way to not being that function. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah. So, every, so this is incoherent. Step, yeah, this is incoherent. Is <clears throat> right, this is incoherent. That's assuming that as the animal changes, as all of the features of the animal change, right, from one function to the other, they also work completely in uniform together, right, even though their functions are changing, right? Then why grant the premise in the first place? Which premise? The premise that the pre-valve exists. To, Can to I just clarify, we're not talking about <clears throat> valves on the heart. We're talking about up the neck. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The uh, problem is there's an endless structure. succession of questions, right? You grant the premise. We answer the question, assuming the premise, and now you take away the premise. H how many questions do we have to answer before you're satisfied, I guess, is the question. Satisfied with what, though? I mean, I'm asking for... You, basically, I'm asking you guys to stay consistent with your, your, your narrative here and say that any point in time right previous to the current iteration of an animal right and it's in its traits it's, it's uh, phenotype uh, anatomy and so forth that grayson's saying for evolution to make sense and be coherent every not just the valve every aspect of a given organism on its way to changing its function maintains its functionality even though each of the functions are changing so so all fun it's like saying like there's a there's a there's a uh, an engine right and the engine is built for a certain function right and you say well the carburetor is going to change over time and so is the other thing right and so is this other thing but all of the changes taking place are are still an advantage right so the system itself is changing that means the relatedness between parts of a system are now becoming unrelated particulars on their way to becoming a new machine that's what evolution is saying. As long as how it could maintains a, a function or gains a new function that's useful, like each one of those is under selective pressures, like as a whole, because the organism's under selective pressure. Are they part. unrelated? Are they unrelated mechanisms inside the are, system? Are what unrelated mechanisms? Any given mechanism of a biological system is it detached or unrelated from the rest of the, the mechanisms in the same it system? It all contributes to the overall fitness of both the organism and the population. Right. And so the changing of one mechanism, like a heart, like a valve, let's say in this case, and some other mechanism that's adjacent to the valve, right? You're saying for any pinpointed name of a mechanism in a biological system from one point in evolution to point B in evolution, you're saying they all changed at the same time to different functions, but the organism itself was able to maintain its its behaviors, its its um, ability to breed, its ability to defend itself. But yet yeah. that what you're what you're saying is a set of related particulars that make up a system are changing individually to become 
new particulars of a new system, but on the way, they they com they're completely workable the whole time. They're all under the selective pressure. So yeah, if right. any of them was not workable and it negatively impacted the fitness of an organism, it would be selected out of the population. Like there's all these things can can vary, right? They they can vary independently based on their mutations and genomic sequences. But if they don't work, if they negatively impact fitness, they're going to be culled out of the population. Yeah, that's begging the question. That's just saying that the things that exist today went through the process you're assuming, right? And we know this because they're here. And, th and that's, that's all that you're saying. But the question is, how could you explain from the theory, from the mechanistic view of what evolution is and does, how do you explain how one organism with a bunch of related particulars of mechanisms that's functioning as a whole system, you're saying each of those mechanisms change over time, I'm saying how, right? And how do they maintain some sort of uh, relatedness the whole time if each of them are changing toward a different end? They're, they somehow they somehow are loyal to each other this whole time, right? I don't understand what you mean by loyal to each other, but they have to work or else the organism is going to die. I understand. You're saying the ones that survived, obviously that process happened. I'm asking you, you can't actually explain how evolution describes that process you just assume it exists i'm asking well, mechanically i'll ask evo how do you evo you're pretty good at steel manning i gotta i gotta say um what what do you think i'm actually saying here uh well so my problem is with the line of questioning itself because these are irreducible complexity arguments right the problem with irreducible complexity arguments is you can always come up with another with another one i guess is the problem there's the heart there's the eye there, there's all these different organs that are supposedly irreducibly complex we can have a million different conversations like at what point does the line of questioning end that, that's kind of what i keep coming back to okay but i i didn't ask you your contention i asked you what do you think i'm asking here what you're asking for are how can this mechanistically occur right you're, you're saying how can all these things cohere at the same time throughout the generations without degenerating or, or something am I, am well I right? yeah yeah Wait, and i would up. say hold on let me just finish this one bit and is that is that you know irreducible irreducible complexity your your base theory is basically arguing this that he's he's saying he's, he's about to go and try to reject irreducible complexity but at the same time he's saying that um for the animals we see today and all of these changes that happen at the particular level inside the system all changing toward a new function right all of them had to actually play an essential part. The absence of one or the other might collapse the whole system. That is that not the definition of irreducible complexity? Sure. Jim Bob. We're not accepting the premise of irreducible complexity. Wait, wait, I can. Can I you define totally it? Can you define what it is would, for the audience? Yeah, I can. It, it, an irreducibly complex system, as per Behe, is a system where if you remove one part of that system, then the system can no longer function. <clears throat> that, and, okay. and would you be happy if we could like just actually show you before your very eyes an irreducibly complex system evolving because we've demonstrated that it's been documented. Oh, okay so you don't reject that irreducible complex systems exist well i personally would not use that terminology i'm just meeting you on on your terms here. what about you evo do you reject that irreducible complexity as as base theory defined it exists i agree with his take on irreducible complexity so yeah, you accept evolve. the term, right? But you're saying it can't evolve. You're, okay, so the irreducible complexity as a definition you accept, right? Sure. That that could that does exist at some scale, right? Not maybe you're arguing it doesn't exist on every scale. No, there so, are systems where if you remove a part, the system no longer functions. We can like a heart, like right. a heart or a brain. Sure, and we have okay. seen those systems evolve like through natural selection and mutation, et cetera. We've, we've seen it both in the, in the lab and in the wild. I okay, so it. the question is from the evolutionary view, right, from point A to point B, you're assuming every animal, right, that, that needed parts to exist, because you're certainly not arguing there was ever an organism that existed that had no single part that if you removed um, it would just end the existence of it, right? I think the assumption is on the other side because the assumption is if we if we can 
explain how an irreducibly complex system can evolve for every animal except for just one, then the whole thing falls. If there's an infinite number of irreducibly complex things and we can't literally come up with a case for every single one, then even if most of them, you have an explanation for them, the whole thing right. falls. Well, well, I'm saying, well, I'm saying the these are side. two different arguments. I'm saying that um, inside a system, there could be some aspects or, or mechanisms that if you're removed or not removed, it wouldn't play a part in its survivability, right? And that's what you're saying is that irreducible complexity um, <clears throat> you can say there's a system inside a system that if you tweak that one system, then the, that little system might fail, but that doesn't mean the whole system fails, sure. right? Okay, so if that's the case, what we're arguing is that that um, for point A to point B to happen with everything happening, right? All the components working, but at the same time, they're changing. So what you're arguing is that for every organisms we see today, right, that... Um, the, especially the multicellular cellular ones, the sexual ones, the ones with populations, um, that every step along the way, uh, they were both utilizing their functions, right? They're, that they had a usefulness, but also ch each of those functions are changing over time. Mm -hmm. So they're changing away from their current function. So yeah. their, their, their trajectory is actually against their current function. Well, we're suggesting that there are a lot of little micro functions. And when you combine them, there's a macro function. There's a macro function that will not exist if they're not combined. Yeah, wait, I, if I can real quick, I, I, what I'm sh saying is that <laughs> in principle, something being categorized as irreducibly complex does not mean that it could not have evolved. That's what I'm saying is that irreducible complexity is not a good argument against evolution because we have uh, well, seen irreducibly complex systems. That's, evolve. I, yeah, I think that's a, you know, from what I gather from the irreducible complexity is not that it couldn't evolve. It's that you need to grant yourself those existing parts. What do you mean? Like you need okay, to wait, give yourself a system. You need to give yourself a system that yeah. works together with parts. Yeah. Let right. Just... Then you then you're saying, well, that thing could adapt and change, right? Well, that's not the argument. The argument is that 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 very structure, right, that you have has to come into play with all those parts at the same time, right? That, right, that they have to that. that they come into play at the same time. Yeah, we've observed it. Observe what exactly? Exactly what you just described. Like, like for example, a, we in the lab, here's an example from in the lab and irreducibly complex. <laughs> this is the most simple kind of system you could imagine, right? All they had was a self-replicating RNAs, like, and, and it just would self-replicate. And it diverged into a population of five different ones, and they all required each other to become a self-replicating system as a whole. So now it's no longer just one self-replicating RNA type molecule. Now it's five different ones. And if you remove one of them, then all five of them can no longer reproduce. They became a, a reproducing system where all five parts came about like at the same time and were necessarily interdependent for the whole system to replicate. And that was observed in the lab. Well, you observe replication of an existing thing, part, right? You start with just one. With a replicator. replicator. Yeah, you start then with you a replicator. Five that are different, like, and those five arose over the course of the experiment, and those five were each necessary for all of them to continue reproducing. Yeah, I would say that the uh, the argument for the um, irreducible complexity would be about the replicator itself rather than what the replicator is capable okay, so of doing once you have it. I don't think that that's an argument from irreducible complexity. Then that's more of it. Like basically how evolution works is that it takes something pre-existing and modifies right. it to either become better or it, a bit modifies it for a different function. Like it, it, it works on something that's already there and then modifies it. That's, that's how it functions. Okay. I'm going to ask this uh, question because I don't want to totally ignore super chats here. Sean, thank you so much from Canada, 1399. If the pre-valve had function X, the new valve has function Y. How did this maintain a use in the in-between phase? That's what kind of I'm asking. Sounds like a transitional valve record, right? Yeah, so that's kind of my question is that you're, I get your point of view. You're assuming, well, it had to produce value if it survived and changed it to something else. We're actually asking a different question. At any point in time, when is this function changing to a different one? 
Um, is it in chapters, you know, fi five chapters like a book? Is it, um, is it, it does the, the function of this thing change uh, quickly or is it a long-term change? Is it, can it be non-functioning until it is functioning? Like these are the kind of physical high resolution questions that kind of what I'm asking, not asking larger, res you know, wider resolution of what you think the story is. I'm asking like physically what's actually happening from point X in this example to Y. At any given point, you're going to say, well, the function is no longer X, but it's not actually Y. And I'm saying, so what is the function in between? And what are the intervals of its function change? You know what I mean? That's a fair question. If sure. X is one function and Y at the tail end is another function, everything in between you're saying is a function, of course, because it's it's still there. It has to be functional. Yeah. We're asking, what are the intervals of the, the functional differences sure. of, so of this part? It's going to depend on the context. For example, if it's a gene that we're talking about that has function X, there can be a duplication event. So now you have two genes that are both doing function X, but you can have one of those genes changing in a way that doesn't affect your ability to do function X. You can still do it because you still have a copy of that gene. But now this duplicate is free to mutate and can start doing function Y. That is what happened with nylonase, for example. Nylonase is a protein that digests nylon not found in nature because nylon is not found in nature. It's man-made. But we've seen bacteria that had a duplication and then a frame shift mutation that created an entirely new family of protein that could digest. Okay, but yeah, but that's that's like molecular stuff. We're talking yeah. about an actual fleshy part called well, like it's a valve. Still evolution. It's going from function X to function Y. I get it, but I, it. you wanted it in detail, mechanistically. No, that's no, that. no, no, no. That's just explaining at a molecular level how genes could duplicate. We're we're talking what you, to make that analogous. You'd have to say a valve duplicated had a reserve valve that just maintained what it was doing but a new valve was created right it for its new function in the future that's actually not clearly not what you're claiming is happening right uh, my example hit on what the question was asking function x to function y and i provided that mechanism valve for a detail. valve for a valve it, not, it not for a gene not question. for a gene no we're talking about valves here hold on okay. reese well, martin I already stipulated that i don't know what what anatomical feature that these giraffe jugular valves mm. evolved from. So if we could get that information, I mean, if it's known, if it's postulated about, if there's sure. evidence for it, I would look into it, but I don't have enough details on specifically giraffe valve evolution to answer that. Sure. No problem. Maybe. Reese Martin, $10 questions for the evolutionist. How do you know the earth is millions of years old without assuming forces today have always been the same? Obviously, that's outside of the evolutionary, but you guys can answer if you want. You can't know that the sun will come up if, if you don't assume this. Um, you can't do science if, if you don't assume that the regularity laws of, the, that, that the yeah. laws of physics can change. That's, that's basic human so, critique of yeah. induction. I, could, right. I, I would just say that we know that accelerated nuclear decay cannot be a thing because it would melt the Earth's surface and destroy everything. Um, if and and you can have zircon crystals that have appreciable amounts of lead in them, and we know beyond any doubt that zircon crystals cannot form with any amount of starting lead. So for that lead to be in that zircon crystal, it had to have come from radiometric decay. And if that decay was accelerated, it would produce enough heat and radiation that it would wipe out all life on Earth many times over. So, but it could have that could have happened though. It just you're saying it just didn't. Like the question is, is granting the mathematics of the radiometric decay and it's denying that the, the universe was the same in the past. Is, is that right? Yeah, the law that the laws couldn't uh, yeah. wouldn't necessarily be the same. They just happened to be the same in the past. Uh, Blue Skittle four ninety nine. What evolved into a monkey? You either of you can take this. Um, there's an interesting transition at the very like base of the of monkey and primate uh family trees i think it's like uh darwinius pugatorius or something it's it, it kind of superficially resembles like a squirrel kind of creature but with a bit more of a forward facing face that's kind of what developed into monkeys do you disagree posh <laughs> i'm just kidding uh, that's <laughs> um do you guys you can bring up another topic evo or no. base theory 
Nubs, your chat has been calling. Yeah, we can uh, we can finally uh, move on to the nubs. Yes. Nubby. Oh yeah. Well, the nubs is gonna. I don't want to rehash the same argument. It's basically saying, in the, <laughs> I always ask the evolution proponent, how do you go from mechanically, not assuming it, it happened over millions of years, or whatever. I'm saying, we, asexual to sexual, the nubby thing is funny because there had to be a time in our in all of uh you know multicellular sexual populations that some point where there's space between not being sexual and becoming sexual um there would be some yes. appendages that are growing that aren't doing their function but oh, they're on their way so, so that so that last part is the premise that's wrong so yes there's a transition from asexual to sexual but this is actually at the unicellular level you don't need a copulatory organ at all at its base Damn, next, stole it's just, my thunder, <laughs> Evo. <laughs> sorry i haven't talked as much i gotta this is my thing um so sex at its like rudiments is uh, two haploid cells combining to make a diploid cell. A haploid cell, for example, is so in humans, you heard of 23 and me, right? You have 23 paired chromosomes for a total of 46. So a haploid would have 23 unpaired chromosomes. A diploid cell like a zygote would have 46. So that's at its rudiment what sex is. It's two cells combining that are haploid to make a diploid zygote. No, no penis required. Yeah, well, like that, just... the question. Hold on, hold on. The argument isn't whether or not you need a penis. We're saying that there's a point in time where animals with penises and vaginas, some previous version didn't have it. Correct? Okay, Jim. Bob, correct. I, and the I previous version was sexual really before it had a penis or vagina. Yeah, we're not asking issue, if it's needed. The the issue is that you are conflating two different things. You're conflating the transition from asexual to sexual with yes. the transition from no sure no, yeah yeah no. fine yeah so technically so let, sure. let me address both let me address both because evo was addressing the transition from asexual to sexual which is occurring in single-celled organisms that have no appendages of any kind and then when you're talking about specifically going from no penis to penis you'd be talking about external fertilization to internal fertilization and there are benefits to making that transition even a nub can allow you to do internal fertilization like if you look at birds for example okay. they don't even have a nub they they literally don't even have a nub they they do like a little like basically they have two orifices the male and the female and they put them up uh -huh. next to each other and they just have internal fertilization like that you don't even need okay. a whole nub yet gotcha. but there's a benefit to internal fertilization because it increases the chances of conception okay so how does does it increase the chances of uh reproduction if your mate is something you have to find using your own resources survival skills and you might not even find a mate paradoxically yes how yeah, there are there are compensatory benefits to sexual reproduction like that uh, that o outweigh the resource cost of trying to seek out a mate because what happens in sexual reproduction is when you combine the sperm and egg, there's something called genetic recombination, right? So the genes are, are mixed up. And so the offspring is a mixture of the two parents. And what this does is this rapidly increases the adaptation rate, the mutation, well, not the mutation rate, but the adaptation rate. It increases okay. the variance in the system. And so there are more variants that can be selected from. So evolution rapidly takes off. When you have sexual uh, reproduction, which is why it exists, that's why it gets selected for. And if I can make just one point about that specifically, about the ex the benefits, because we see this in single-celled org organisms, right? Single cells normally reproduce asexually, but when they're in very stressful environments or there's a huge overpopulation, they switch to a different mode of sexual reproduction where they're exchanging their genetic information. They're no longer reproducing asexually. When you have this stress on this population, the population switches to a sexual mode of reproduction because of the benefits that Evo just laid out. That the whole right. Well, well, the que the question isn't what what cool tools do they have, right? We're asking a, a question of they developed the tools, right, before they could use them. No, no. Okay, so, so they didn't miraculously have well, the there, tools. No, so there are benefits to each one of these steps, like being diploid versus haploid. There are benefits to that because if you have DNA yes. damage, then you have an intact copy to which you can like use as a template to make those repairs. So there's benefits to being diploid. There's benefits to having the machinery of meiosis before you have sexual reproduction because we see this in archaea and bacteria that do just like they don't do okay. sexual reproduction. So my question is wait, 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 real quick. They just literally just give their gene like gen genetic material. They just exchange it like directly into each mm -hmm. other's genomes. 
And like that also has benefits and it uses a lot of the very similar cellular machinery that sexual reproduction does. Okay, so the question is, if you're saying, well, every point along the way from no penis to nub to full penis, right, is all, it all works, right? It all has benefit. Even the, pre, the pre-penis uh, nub, you know, there's a, there's a, a pre-vagina dimple, let's say, and all, you're saying along this process, every variation of sex, you know, is useful, right? Well, I guess my question is like, what is, what is the explanation? I'll be of, right back, sorry. What is the explanation of that all the animals we identify to have um, uh, penises and vaginas, relatively, um, they're all the same generally shape and size relative to their body. Like, are wouldn't there be some in between where it's like halfway not there yet like are you assuming that that some of the the smaller nubs uh, that you're pointing out are on their way to having a like a a full dick no the, no there's okay so that's not required at all yeah it, there there first of all there isn't that uniformity across the animal kingdom that you're talking about there's like a huge diversity of of penises basically but like like i pointed out birds they literally don't even have a nub and they're going mm-hmm. The opposite way like the birds used to have a penis and then they've devolved they, they've evolved to not have them because it wasn't necessary and you can even just kind of ejaculate on top of the female and she can still get pregnant like yeah and with, with humans like like the majority of like the size of a human penis comes from sexual selection it's not necessary to have as large of a penis as some of us are blessed with but it was sexually selected for it wasn't nat- like it wasn't natural selection based on survival or efficiency you can be just as no efficient. no i'm not saying i'm saying that the general identifying feature that it is i'm not saying like you know i'm saying that it's an identifiable feature that's fully formed for that animal right for the ma- for the the mammal let's say and i'm asking you um wouldn't you see some um variation even in that mammal where it's not even it's like halfway there right you it's not even that f- variation so where who which animal has a halfway uh a, you know a 30 percent are you just 30%er. talking about the size or what are you talking about with 30 percent here like not so, complete you would have to tell me it's not complete right you'd have to be able to point to a penis I, I don't grant that there's a complete penis like, yeah, there's it, no complete it's, in, like, it, it's functional you would say that wouldn't you like, even before yeah. you had a penis <laughs> When you had external fertilization, right? Both the male and the female are just Asians. <laughs> both the male okay. and the female are literally just putting out all of those gametes in the water, and then they're mixing like that. There's there's no internal fertilization; it's all external. And then as soon as you have a like some sort of mechanism to where you can more target where you release your gametes, that's going to provide instant benefits. Can and you can you predict? Can you predict? for any given species that they're on their way of removing their penis. Uh, yeah, a lot of birds have already done that. No, not I didn't ask what had been done. I'm like, can you point to a specific species and predict the future absence of their penis? Is that necessary for us to be able to do that, to speculate on the future? I mean, that would be a pretty good uh, prediction based on evolutionary it would, it would be pretty theory. Cool, but I, I don't, okay. I don't think. It's I think necessary. I actually do have a paper that does that exactly. So let me see if I can. Pull well, it. I mean, if we're talking about predictions, it's easy. It's for me, my view, it's easier to predict things um, through a paradigm that interprets the data when you dig it up versus what we can actually see. Can you predict, like, you know, obviously your paradigm requires a long period of time, so it wouldn't be you. Not verifying the prediction, but it seems that uh, evolution proponents should be um, looking at animals today, and instead of making a uh, you know sort of you know looking back after you find stuff, creating a storyline of a prediction, it would be interesting if you could pr- do a prediction of any given animal. Where is it on its way out? You know, like our you know um, you know forgiven animals like could you tell me if they're on their way of growing legs right could could you tell me anything like that i just want to be very clear that the example i brought up earlier was not just digging stuff up and then interpreting it it was predicting its anatomy mm. beforehand you you keep messing yeah that with you can't no you, you that's not neutral though so that's not a neutral, not neutral it's not neutral in the way you're interpreting the data it's not neutral 
but they predicted the anatomy beforehand. I don't see how you can, I don't understand yeah, what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I don't want to go in a circle, but the whole point is that you, you can predict similarities of things, and that's what you're saying. You just happen to call the similarity transitional or intermediate. It's just a word play game, um, and even Evo understands this. He disagrees with my stance on this, but he understands that <clears throat> the the way in which you're interpreting data that in camel world you couldn't really use to tell me the methodology you're just saying similarity similar enough let's call it intermediate let's call it you know uh transitional and you're just naming the thing to make the prediction seem novel but really you're just predicting if we look into the ground will we find animals similar to other animals i don't see what's so well, fascinating not, about that they're not similar to other animals that's the kink these are anatomies that what do not exist today these are, what are they similar to no, but they're they're literally predicted like novel anatomies that don't exist today uh -huh. exist beforehand. Like show me what fish has a neck or wrist bones. But that was predicted in Tiktaalik and then it was discovered. I don't I'll just stop calling it transitional. I'll just say predicted anatomies because yeah. that is a more neutral term. Well, I mean, you could say like I predict, you know, some animal is going to have this feature and you just keep looking until you do. I don't see how that is uh, you know, warrants a celebration to the narrative that animals turn into other animals over because time through changes in, in allele frequency. The mechanism that allowed us to make these predictions was your mind. This is not just saying like, like if creationism was true and you could say, well, I could predict there to be some sort of an anatomy that we haven't seen before, but you should be able to predict that for any two groups of animals, you should be able to find weird little hybrid anatomies between them. But that's not the case. It's not the case that you can just pick any two groups of animals and find this this you know hybrid type anatomy. It's only the ones that evolution is predicting that we're the ones. The, the, those are the ones that were being found. Yeah, but here's the thing. What's the mechanism you're saying you're using to predict? Well, basically, you take two groups that are genetically similar. And then you should be able to use evolution to predict that there was a common ancestor between them. And so then you can predict between that common ancestor, that point A, and the current species, point B, you should be able to use, like, basically make the intermediate features between the two. And that's how you predict the anatomy. So, yeah, to me, what you're calling a... a um... A mechanism, a mechanism is just a paradigm. It's just like our paradigm predicts that we'll find evidence that supports our paradigm. I mean, that's all I'm hearing from you. I mean, I don't think you could possibly do this without presupposing some sort of philosophical lens. And, and this is true for science as this well. This is why but, I made my video. Yeah. Yeah, Evo, you have a point is that, the, you know, it's even if you disagree with the philosophical presupposition someone has, you're at least understanding that that's going to inform how you interact with uh, evidence so that's a higher level philosophical um, approach that you know obviously this wasn't meant to be that this is about more me um, uh, mechanics i want to know about the mechanics of evolution <clears throat> so but that's you know you know you know you're, we couldn't get around this by the way because because your paradigms inform the way in which you interpret data right you have to presuppose something and then you go find it, and if it matches, you have to make additional arguments uh, uh, to say that, well, your view of how things occurred over time is true merely by interpreting some data in a certain way. So, um, Gnostic Informant, $10, what's going on, Neil? Did God create ligers? Posh, that's obviously obviously for you. <coughs> Why did he need to use a lion and a tiger to make them? Well, God doesn't need anything. Uh, is he bound by laws of biology? No. Why can't God create blue-eyed, blonde-haired babies from two black parents? I mean, <clears throat> it is interesting that uh, I think it's still the case statistically that um, blacks uh, have the highest rate of... Uh, um, albinism. What's it called? Yeah, albinism. I don't know if that's yeah. still the case. I knew that was a trend. Um, but uh, yeah, those... Yeah, uh, that's not very advantageous when you get chopped up for parts. <laughs> for, right, right. For good luck charms. Uh, but <laughs> so obviously, uh, again, if you're going to do any type of theology, because this was a theological question, uh, obviously. Uh, this God one. can... Yes, yes, let's address it. Liger, obviously, 
mixture of lion and tiger. Uh, not a particularly useful animal in the wild, too large uh, to hunt, uh, and again, being larger requires more calories to maintain itself. So that's that's a, a negative feedback loop. Uh, but if you want to say God needed to use a lion and a tiger, that's a silly question, theologically speaking. Uh, God, uh, in the sense that we as Christians would talk about God, uh, would is transcendent uh, and not even bound by laws of logic. That's that's uh, that's a silly thing to ask. So God uh, saying, well, why didn't he do it is a different question than can he do it? Um, if you want to, if God wants to, he can uh limit himself but uh, ultimately he is uh, uh unrestrained even by laws of logic and could shatter reality that's a completely different thing from asking why didn't god make a liger that's what what you were asking you know if, if you want to ask it seriously right uh can god create a liger out of a rock sure why not mm -hmm. Um, but uh, asking why didn't he do it is a completely different question. Yeah, that's an incredulity. Uh, it's just a personal incredulity fallacy to say like, well, if we presuppose God can do everything, premise two is why not he do stuff I think he should do ends up being a baseless argument. Um, Andrew, what novel predictions does creationism make about animals? I, I would say that um, um, creationism predicts that human beings will seek to become their own gods. And if you say, think uh, humans are animals, that's a novel prediction about animals. Um, but uh, theology isn't a, uh, a naturalistic lens, by the way. So, you know, there's nothing that states, oh, I'm Christian and I believe in the story of creation. Therefore, um, I have my, you know, the science is covered right through the, through my, uh, interpret my interpretation of the Bible. Um, these are two different categories of of knowledge and application completely. So, so I have a question. Um, how is it in a non evolutionary worldview that you would be able to explain the fact that if we're given a certain ratio of radiometric isotopes, say uranium lead or potassium argon or whatever, we're given a certain ratio in a certain layer, we can then predict well, we're going to find these kinds of fossils above that layer and these kinds of fossils below that layer. Why Why is it that these fossils would be separated in such a discrete pattern that just based on radi knowing radiometric isotopes, we can know what is above and below? Well, pa like Posh said before, we're going to we're going to we're not going to grant <laughs> um, the methodology of all the dating you're appealing to. But if we granted it. As I didn't, Posh I didn't said before, any dating. I didn't appeal to any dating at all. All I said God. was, you just know the the isotope ratio. That doesn't involve any time or any dating or any assumptions. That's a so. What's your so so? What's your question? So if if you're get if we're given a certain ratio of radiometric isotopes, we can know what fossils will be found above that layer and what types of fossils will be found below that layer. Why is it that such a pattern should exist in your worldview? the pattern of finding different fossils at different layers of land? It's not just that. It's like, we know that, you know, if this fossil gave, or if this layer gave a certain radiometric isotope ratio, right? Say that, you know, we, we might label it as <coughs> Cretaceous or something. Um, then we would know what we, we should be able to find below it are dinosaurs and trilobites. And what we should find above it are no dinosaurs, no trilobites and like mammoths or something like there's a certain order to this fossil record that is like you can know based on radiometric isotope ratios like you can know what's going to be found above and below those radiometric isotopes why is that well how what's the contradiction well how is that possible in a worldview other than one where evolution is true because that's the only explanation i could think of so wait a second you find different patterns in fossils at different layers therefore animals change there's no other way i can think of to explain how is that, that how does that follow because the different the ways in which these fossils are sorted vertically cannot be explained by by any other known means well other well than, like, other than no other than animals existed 
and then they didn't exist anymore, and then they're they're trapped in in matter and material. Yeah. So how? Why would you? Why that? would you assume? Why would you assume the ability to make categoric, by the way, arbitrarily defined taxonomically uh, uh, arbitrary categories? Um, why would your ability to uh, predict at different layers what you might find, right, through your own paradigm, by the way, yeah. um, how would that? How would that affirm that animals change from one animal to a different animal over time? Because these are sorted by species. But really quick, I want to just say these are what? not arbitrary taxonomic categories. All taxonomy right? is arbitrary. It's it's not. Spe it's no, no. Evolution actually has to reject even the term species ultimately. Sure. Species we can reject. I don't have any issues with rejecting species. But in terms of the taxonomic classifications, these are not arbitrary. There's a genetic underpinning to this. All no, there's mammals, anatomical. No, there's anatomical. Uh, no, all mammals are more genetically similar to any other mammals than to any non-mammals. This is not arbitrary. These yeah, are, but yeah, but you could say, yeah, but it says nothing because we are genetically similar to a banana. Also, what does that say? I just from said, your view, it's about comparative genom genomics. So it's arbitrary because I can because it's not I can yeah too. all genet. What if I said all genetic matter has some overlapping uh, informational or observational um, um, patterns or or sure. whatever you're looking at? Sure. So what does that say? Is it, does that mean all of Earth is one animal? Is that the follow? No. Okay. The point is right. It's just the gen the patterns of genetic similarity. All mammals are more similar to all other mammals than to any non-mammal. That is not arbitrary. That is a firm genetic basis for the category of mammal. So this is not an arbitrary category. There's a genetic underpinning. And just FYI, the, the patterns of genetic similarity also persist in non-conserved, non-functional gene regions. So you can't just say, oh, they're similar because they're it's a similar design or it's accomplishing a similar function. Okay, That's cool. Uh, okay, great. Drayson, do you have access to the ancient fossils you're finding? Do you have access to their genes? Um, I have an ancient fossil right here, but I don't have its genomes. Right. So the whole problem, again, is like um, similar things genetically today, right, versus... Uh, things that are anatomically similar to things today that are genetically similar, there's a jump because, as we established at the beginning of this talk, that anatomically or phenotypically similar things do not follow with genetically similar. Right. It sounds like your whole position is resting on genetic similarities. So you, for example, if, if I wanted to determine if I had a brother and we did a DNA test and it came back positive that that is my brother, we do not need the DNA of our parents to confirm that fact. So in the same way, with two different species, you can do a, an exactly analogous test of genetic similarity. You don't need the genetics of their common ancestor in order to confirm that they did have a common ancestor. Well, if we said populations exist, obviously what we're referring to ancestors as, as previous um, uh, similar animals, right, with the same reproductive pathways and uh, the ability to reproduce and so forth back in time. That's a different question. Whether there's there are ancestors, we probably define that as different. To The difference is that if you, from, from your view, you go back far enough, there's completely dissimilar ancestors. Like, uh, you know, you get, you get people saying, do, I, I mean, do you guys both take the approach that you're, that, uh, that a strawberry and a banana is technically your ancestor? No, no. nobody would agree with that. No. Are you genetically related? Yes. You're genetically related, but that doesn't mean it's an ancestral so, relationship. That'll be okay. like asking if I if I agree that you are my ancestor. Right. Okay. So so I'm trying to figure out how you're meeting the similarities in ge uh, genetics to say to assume ancestry. Well, Jim Bob, you would agree that you and I have genetic similarities, and therefore we have a common ancestor. But you're not ancestral to me. Right, but 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 that's from the view that we know how humans are produced. Well, we do know how humans. I'm saying uh, you're saying that there are ancestors that no longer produce that didn't produce the same way we produce. You you have ancestors, so why not a banana anyway? I mean, I don't understand what the distinction is. If your ancestor could be something previous to an uh you know a monkey. And previous to that, you said it was like a squirrel monkey. Previous to that, it's something that's not similar to that, right? At some point, it's dissimilar, right? 
Yeah, so why, why not the banana? Humans and yeah. all plants yeah. be a single cell right. organism. Right. From your view, ancestry could lead to completely dissimilar, right, organisms that not in a million years could they, in the same time frame, you know, mate and reproduce. But, but nonetheless, you're saying that you can go far back as, as evolution permits you. And you would have to agree at some point, something equivalent to a banana, right, would be your ancestor. No, it would not be equivalent. Okay, where's it? Okay, where's the arbitrary line where ancestry stop, starts, uh, you know, begins for human beings? Then the common ancestor would be the thing that, that possesses traits that are not unique to a banana or unique to a human. I got it. That's not. That I understand you're defining what that is. I'm asking where in the lineage does that begin? Okay. Where in so, the lineage does your the ancestry of human beings begin, even in its dissimilar form? You could go single all cell. the way back to the last universal common ancestor that's a single cell that's a common ancestor for all life today. A single cell. Yeah, because cause even, even their cells are constructed differently from ours. Like, for example, bananas have a cell wall. We, we do not. So even at the single cell level, they, they diverged like well before. Okay. And so for the single cell, is there another uh, at that time, if you're going back in time before any of these multicellular organisms exist, mammals and so forth, <clears throat> that at that time, could you point to any other single cell and say, well, they're there. We're from the same uh, ancestral line. Because you're just doing the thing all over again, just at the molecular level, it seems. It's like, oh, how far back do we take the human being to its form where you say that's our ancestor and you say the strawberry is not it but this other glob of of material it is well, you and i go okay what's you, simple you okay probably, you typically don't point to like a fossil or something and say that is the ancestor i understand okay yeah i understand fossils well, couldn't I, possibly so give you that you we told we gave you the example of a single cell the last universal common ancestor for all life on earth a single cell mm -hmm. so given mm -hmm. that example what is your question my question is now what is what is their ancestor no, so it so I, I can evaluate I can evaluate the question. So the problem is we're asking, okay, like how can you determine that a banana is related to a human? And the problem is this is an empirical question, right? So what we're gonna answer with is like based on the phylogenetic tree that we've constructed, right? Where where we place that is gonna be a prediction of the phylogenetic tree. But the problem is this is kind of like camel world all over again, right? Where you're inserting like a lack how how do I describe this? You're inserting like a lack of knowledge. Under determinism? Here. I'm sorry. Well, I would I would say that it's you don't have to construct any phylogenetic tree for this. Like genetic similarities indicate relationships always, point blank. Like that's that's okay, how so we're again, he's asking he's asking an empirical question. So we're, we're giving but I we're gave giving him phylogenetic answer. trees and genetics and and all this stuff. You know, but the, it's, it's the camel all over genetic again. similarities. Point blank period. That's how paternity tests work. Genetic similarities how? always are indicate indicative of relationship. Okay, so we're related to a banana. Yes. Yeah, related, not ancestrally okay. related, but related, yes. Okay. The, the way you determine relatedness, you're going to have to use all of these different methodologies, gen genetics, morphology, whatever, cells, whatever. Okay. You, you really but, don't. You really don't need any other methodology other than genetic similarity. That's You, okay. you don't okay. need anything else. So, but, 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 but the question is, because we're talking <laughs> about human origins, the question is, as with the camels, like, okay, are they evolving or not? And the answer is yes. And the way you determine, well, what's the previous form? Well, you need to have knowledge of the world to determine what the previous form is. Mm -hmm. that, that's so it the does. Problem. The point is that the whole entire system of thinking um, it does does go back. You know, I, I wouldn't say it's infinite regress, but it just does force the proponent. If you're going to keep making these claims back and back in time, I don't see how you can avoid a biogenesis or some sort of pseudo creation story. I actually predict uh, that both of you, well probably more so base theory and that's not a dig is that i bet you you're going to adopt some sort of intelligent design in the next 20 years that's naturalistic and well, based on like that. aliens or something no. you know because because you need because eventually in back in time you're going to need that start point which evolution itself is the stopping point right there because we just say i i could just ask you is there anything on, on uh, that's that's living that's not Come, that's uh you would say def definitively is not related to a human being genetically no okay. not definitively okay. maybe a virus or something but mm -hmm. again that's not living so right 
So what's like, this? What's this initial form then? That's the question, right? Because because if about, when you say initial form, because it is a, a gradation, like right, like there's it sounds uh, like a degradation. No, it's not. There's self reproducing chemical systems, right? Then those could take a variety of different forms and eventually lead to proto cells that lead to the first single cellular organisms that lead to LUCA. Mm -hmm. we, we could go through all of that. I mean, abiogenesis doesn't require intelligent design. Abiogenesis, the skip from a non-living organic matter to living organic. Yeah, it doesn't require any intelligent design. Okay. So you're going to have non-replicating matter to replicating matter. Uh, well, it's a bit more complex because you, you need it just to, uh, it needs fidelity in whether it transfers uh, the sure. replication. So um, we've seen that arise spontaneously, naturalistically. Like I would point to mm, Ample. No, you haven't. Ample. What? No, you haven't. Yes, what we, you, we have actually. Yes. Would you watch? Would you watch spontaneously? We've seen amyloids form in a lab that then proceed to. Is a lab spontaneous? That, that hold on. Spontaneous just means that it's energetically favorable, right? So it's these amyloids form that act as a template for further amyloid reproduction that that reproduces that sequence of Did it, was there an intelligent being orchestrating that there was no intelligent no scientist no just happened in a lab did it okay, happen well, in a lab you're just talk over my response i mean well i mean it's just funny because you're saying you're saying I, I was qualifying what i was saying jim bob i was saying that okay, there was I'm just, no intelligent just saying, agency that ever determined what sequence this initial amyloid would have it formed spontaneously in a lab yes it was catalyzed by a naturally occurring volcanic gas, carbonyl sulfide. And a person? I mean, the person was not in any way. Did the person catalyze it? The person was not influencing what Did anything in the lab was okay. occurring. Okay. If okay. you want to just say that, like, oh, if we form snowflakes in a lab, that proves that intelligent design is necessary for snowflakes to form. Naturally. No, I would say, I would say it, it, it proves that intelligent beings are necessary to create snowflakes in a lab. That's what I would say. But snowflakes can occur naturally, right? Right. And, and they're not and producing snowflakes in a lab does not mean that snowflakes cannot form naturally. Right. So what's the point of the experiment? The point of the experiment was to show that amyloids can form naturally with only naturally occurring substances acting as catalysts that link amino acids together into this amyloid that has self reproduction and inheritability characteristics. Is there it can it can reproduce its own sequence through time? Does that require information exchange? Uh, could you explain what you mean by information exchange? Because the information was essentially from the surrounding environment, just from the diffusion pattern of mm. molecules for how these amino acids came together. That sequence was not predetermined. It was not intelligently designed. It came about because of the environment. And that information was then replicated to further generations of amyloids. Is the information identical to the matter you're speaking of? Um. Sure. I mean, information requires a material medium. So, so is information identical to the medium? Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, let's take a basic example. If I say the word apple and air comes out of my mouth, perturbates the air and hits on your eardrum and you understand what it means, is apple identical to the air? No. Okay, so... What I'm saying is information, even in your, sen your sense, right? You're actually not witnessing spontaneous information. You're actually taking existing things and components, putting them in a scenario that's guided by the scientist and watching a phenomenon happen. But you can't actually observe and, and de determine the phenomenon happen without assuming that there's information uh, also being exchanged. But information is not physical. So there's always going to be a gap in what you're saying based because you still need an account for the information well, I, I think that information always has a physical medium so you talked about the air or you talk about the pattern of neural activity when i when i hear you say apple versus the actual apple itself like those are all different things right right but i'm saying that your example right mm -hmm. is assuming in an immaterial aspect that's not observed in the i don't think it is scenario uh, 
basically the sequence of the amyloid was not determined in advance by the researchers it was not planned by any intelligence okay it so happened. okay it's like it's like if you if you you know just throw a bunch of rocks together they they could fall into a certain pattern is but, that a chemical reaction though no Okay, so chemical reactions require a little bit more than throwing rocks on the ground and a pattern emerges. We're talking well, about you could have a chemical reaction that can make a condensate with a random with, with like with a specific sequence that was not determined in advance. That is analogous to throwing the rocks into a certain pattern. I think it's a good analogy. I'm saying that rocks throwing rocks together and them landing a certain way, like dice. There's no information exchange. Whereas the thing you're pointing to in the lab, even but there is, is what's there the information. Is. Th those rocks that that pattern that is information that that that, that pattern what's the, the information rock, a rock that's an information right no but what's the information of a rock though this rock mm -hmm. is next to that rock is next to that rock there's a sequence that you could describe you mean a mind dependent assessment i there it's not mind dependent those rocks have that okay. sequence regardless of if a mind is there or not okay what's but that's the thing is like you're you're appealing to patterns right mm -hmm and sequences and then we ask you how do you know those sequences exist and you say well i have a mind to use that, to do that right and we're asking you well pre-human pre-human being you're saying information exchange happened and you conceded that information's immaterial right i did not you did i said it always requires a physical medium a material i said medium. no the question isn't whether it requires medium the question is whether information's identical to the medium and you said no well, look, I don't think information can exist non-materially. It it would give me one example of information that's physical, identical to what we attribute to it. In one example, I don't I don't understand your question. Give me an example of one piece of material information that's identical to matter. That's identical to matter. Like I, I said, the order of these rocks is information bearing it is that which informs it has it has sequence information of how these rocks are arranged spatially like that is that, that is material but it is material that informs about a sequence it is information yeah. right you're you're pointing to basically geometry in a sense that is information yeah okay where is geometry found as matter uh, geometry is a property that matter has that is part of its information like i yeah i know but where is it found as matter because that's what you're claiming is that information's physical and now you're saying ro the formation of rocks which is really just like a, a a way of saying there's a geometric sort of pattern to the rocks as they lay on the ground right but i'm saying the the geometric pattern the classification of the pattern is not identical to the rocks but i don't want to go too deep but it is it is necessary. Uh, I wanted to touch on this because I don't want it to go into a circle. It's just that the point is for you to say, well, we have everything we need for abiogenesis. What I'm saying is, no, you don't have an account for information, the information that's informing the behavior, which is not identical to the matter. And that's all I'm saying. Posh, oh, well, do you want to add anything to this? Natural selection for that. Natural selection of um, uh, pr uh, previous regularity in nature. You know, like you, first of all, base theory, for you to even appeal to natural selection, you need regularity in nature, which itself is outside of the bounds of evolution. So, I mean, this is, this is a huge problem because Why? what? Why would that be a huge problem? Evolution is not attempting to explain the regularity of nature. Right. But that that's where its limitations is. And so the regular, the regularity of nature, right? If it's the thing that's really at cause of even what you call evolution, um, you're really just saying like, well, we arbitrarily stop here. We don't need to account for anything else. We're just talking about, just grant us organisms that are alive, right? Grant us a process that jumps from inorganic, non-living to living. Just grant us it's possible. Wait, 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 not inorganic, sorry, not inorganic. Or, organic? or sorry, organic, organic to, yeah, I got you. Um, just grant us this jump, right? And, and then we'll describe the rest, right? And we're just saying we don't we don't grant the jump. That's okay. All. So, like evolution is simply an explanatory theory for the origin of of species and and species diversity. So yeah, you you don't start with the origin of life. That's a different field. So yeah, I mean 
it's not a evolution's not an all encompassing theory. It doesn't explain the origin of the universe or the laws of nature or whatever. And in terms of the regulation of na- the, the regularity, regularity. Of nature, I would say that that's empirically demonstrated because we've never observed any counterexample of irregularity. Uh, no, that would be like Evo said at the beginning, you have to rely on just a, an assumption. The assumption that things happen in the past isn't actually a justification for assuming it will happen tomorrow. So uh, that's a that's a big problem, uh, as Posh said, uh, Hume's. Yeah, I, I guess the problem Hume, right? of induction, it doesn't bother me because, like, you know, who cares? We know that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, even if we don't really know because of the problem of induction. Why don't I have philosophical whining this? But come on, we all know. It's like... It's good enough to where any person yeah, should yeah. be worried yeah, about. Yeah, ad hoc. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's an it's an ad hoc pragmatic um, philosophy. FB four ninety nine. Humans can also produce their own sequence, giving birth. But the question is, the creator required to make the first human. Yeah, that's what's in question. It's like, for, but for we're talking to people whose view is that there's this initial organism that does its thing and eventually. Uh, turns into a variety of different organisms that eventually become a variety of new organisms and eventually, you, you know, you have whales and human beings and stuff. And Posh, I would just point out that if evolution were true, then we might expect to see some missing links that are more and more basically ape and, and less and less, you know, derived human through the fossil record. And then, hey, we well, got... Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, Artipithecus, Sahelanthropus, Ororine. Like we've got a ton of them. Yeah, it's like a, it's like you bought a bunch of uh, Cracker Jack things and got all the little toys and you arranged them in a certain chronological pattern that fits your presupposition. Hey, why don't you just show me any of the bipedal apes uh, today that are not humans, huh? Because they actually, their positions of the foramen magnum, their hip bones, their feet, all similar. very, very derived. And you mean, and not you mean similar? similar? You mean anatomically similar? Uh, well, similar, but intermediate, like our position of our foramen mm-hmm. magnum is like down here, a uh, chimps is back here. And then mm-hmm. Australopithecus is in between. Okay. So similarity in the position of certain things in the body. Mm-hmm. Now, why wouldn't that just be, um, given Can by I function that real quick? Yeah. But one question, why wouldn't that just be uh, a result of function? Cause even in your evolutionary view, any of the it is. Any of the it's apparatuses are just a result of function. It is a result. So, of so, function. so two animals that are not the same in their lineage, like that, two animals can't produce just a similar effect via function. Um. Yeah, they can. That's okay. So, how do you know the that that's the not the is, case? Is that you can compare like non-functional regions of the genome, and you still reproduce those same patterns of genetic similarity. So, you mean ana- anatomical similarity? Genetic similarity, yeah. Genetic? So, like, you can construct a phylogenetic tree using morphological anatomical similarities. You can also construct it using genetic similarities in functional regions or in non-functional regions. All three of the same ways are going to get you the same overall basic phylogenetic tree of relationships. Okay, it just, yeah, it sounds like you're, I'll, I'll let you read the super chat. I don't want to go in a circle. FB 499, base theory is wrong. Objects behave differently when they're not being observed. Is he familiar with quantum physics? Yeah, I'm very familiar with quantum physics. I've taken quantum mechanics <laughs> one and two on a college level, and I could tell you how the Schrodinger equation works and how these particles evolve over time exactly as the Schrodinger equation predicts uh, so there you go. We, it's not, I, I think that this person that made that comment un- misunderstands uh, quantum physics and the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Ticky tack $5 for based theory, uh, in a prebiotic system. What is the catalyst used to produce selective chiral left-handed amino acids without the contamination of right hand? So I'll mention two different, uh, viable mechanisms. First of all, with amyloids that we already predicted, they preferentially select that same handedness amino acid to to incorporate into the growing scaffold for the the new amyloid. So that explains an angioselectivity, but there's also something called chiral induced spin selectivity, which is induced by like magnetic surfaces like magnetite and stuff. There are magnetic properties that can induce this chiral left handedness. So there's multiple different naturalistic mechanisms that can explain homochirality. Wait, uh, I'm pretty sure chiral induced spin selectivity is about selecting for the electrons and their spin. 
that is the chiral, uh, not medium, but uh, uh, environment allows for this great increase in uh, the efficiency and the reduction of, uh, of uh, electric uh, resistance, uh, which is what allows for, so it's more of a thing you need in order to get an operant system rather than you don't get the chirality from it. It is a result. Uh, like one comes before the other, you're saying, Posh, the thing yes. that's being described isn't an effect, it's a pre it's a precondition for some other things. Well, I can tell you that magnetic surfaces do produce a selective pressure for a certain chirality of molecule, not just electron orbitals or whatever, but like actual the, actually the molecules. Even like James Tour, who's pretty famous in abiogenesis, creationist circles, even he has recently admitted that chiral-induced spin selectivity um, could get you this homochirality uh, outcome in actual like macromolecules okay uh, I, I, i'll look up uh, with the update um he acknowledged it in his recent harvard debate with lee cronin he he brought yeah, up what's it with lee cronin uh it didn't finish it actually because the round table thing was sort of ridiculous it was a weird but, yeah <laughs> oh yeah it made no sense uh fb 999 the eukaryotic cells eukaryotic eukaryotic cells thank you uh having a different structural doesn't change the fact that they're related chimpanzees is in the human related and they have different structure yeah he's saying that the overall structure is different with some similarities in some uh, like what i don't know what you call that like some sub feature or something so he's saying that they could be completely different structures do you want to respond to that uh i don't I fully understand that's what, what he's saying what comment means but like sure you can have different structures between different eukaryotic cells i mean evo just brought up the differences between plant cells and animal cells but that doesn't change the fact that they have a common ancestor <laughs> because of their genetic similarities okay logan daly for ten dollars i'd like to thank jerome bob for the panel and all the panel members for coming on for a civil discussion yeah i do also appreciate that as well um fb says for 4.99 a banana a strawberry are all made up of eukaryotic cells humans are also made up of the same cells so in that sense they are related is that that's the way in which they're related would you is that what you guys are saying it's the thing they have in common yes yeah common. humans and plants are both eukaryotes so and then is there any there's there are things that aren't but are that are still share genetic similarities with humans yeah so there's prokaryotes they don't have like a nucleus or cell organelles they're much more like simple cells like bacteria um but we do still have a nested pattern of genetic similarity in functional and non-functional regions with them as well so we are also mm -hmm. related to them but the pattern gets massively complicated and confused because these prokaryotic cells can do something called horizontal gene transfer, where they just mess up all these phylogenetic trees because they can just transfer a gene just completely horizontally on a phylogenetic. They can just say, hey, you're a different species than I am, but here, have this gene. And so they can do like weird kind of genetic transfers that mess up our ability to do phylogenetic trees for like prokaryotes. Does that mean from your view that um, re regardless of not going into abiogenesis or anything, that any similar genes or inf genetic information has to come from a single source? No, no, you, you can have like, um, I, I think that even in between humans and birds, there's a certain gene involved with like the brain's ability to communicate to the tongue to get it to form words. The birds have independently evolved that same gene basically for their bird songs. Like you can ind independently, convergently evolve the same gene. Yeah, but does that, if that same gene and genetic information, you're saying we're also related to birds? Um, yeah, but not based on just that one gene. Like when you're doing these genetic comparisons, it's important that you don't just look at one gene because yeah, you can have these weird effects where there's independent evolutions of the same gene. You have to look overall at the entire genome both functional and non-functional regions. So who determines the threshold of overlap that makes that then results in the declaration of the most similar versus similar 
Um, but like you said, overlapping information and genes, but you're saying, well, no, that's not enough. So I'm asking like, what's enough? Uh, who, de who determines enough as, as far as overlap? Basically, like there's a certain amount of base pairs that you could compare to where like statistically you would be getting rid of most of those uh, effects that you might have from just individual gene families. Yeah, but what's the statistics? Is it like 40% similar? Is it 80? Is it 20? Is it? What's the um, what's it, the it threshold? It wouldn't be that like percent similarity. It would be talking about like the power of your statistical study, like about like the sheer size in base pairs that you're making the comparison. Okay, uh, Column Rock says, "What about vertical fossils that cross many layers of Earth?" Um, this is a common misunderstanding where <laughs> uh, people, especially creationists, will think that there are fossils that are crossing like vertical vertically crossing these layers that uh scientists claim are millions of years old but in reality whenever you have those those upright fossils the layers that they're passing through are all very similar in age like within a few years of, of each other you, you don't you never find these upright fossils passing through layers that would be like from Cretaceous to Jurassic or something like that. Like the, you never find examples of those. Uh, FB again, 499. Yes, he did appeal to carbon dating. The less carbon 14 and object has the older it is. The less carbon 14, the older um, it is. I never mentioned carbon dating. I mentioned radiometric dating, uh, which is different. Carbon is just, <laughs> carbon dating is just a subset at one type. There's also uranium lead, which is what I brought up with zircon dating. Um, and it the, each one of these dating methods has their own uh assumptions to it but they're mm -hmm. different assumptions and then you can overlap and cross corroborate dates using different independent methods um and then with the the zircon crystal dating like the assum it's not an assumption that zircon crystals cannot form with lead like people have tried no one has been able to get zircon crystals to form with lead starting in them so if you find a zircon crystal and it has lead in it you know that that lead was not there at its formation and had to have come from radiometric decay or contamination, which you can check because if the crystal has been contaminated, then you could you could see on its structure that there's been a breach. What is the margin of error of that dating system that you mentioned? Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, we could look it up if you're interested. The, How, the Zircon, I, a better Zircon question is... Zircon dating is, what, is what's used to date the very oldest layers on earth like the ones that are billions of years old well that's what i'm asking is like not just what's the margin of error because whatever you said i would be asking what's the methodology for determining the margin of error itself um i would i when i try to ask people that um they don't have an answer for the latter they have a general answer for the former uh gnostic informant ten dollars did god cre oh no you already answered that uh this one gnostic informant for five dollars i don't even think jim bob understands how damning this is for creation i'm not sure what you're referring to the fossil records in rock layers are predicted almost 99 percent of the time yeah i don't know how that's it would be damning to a created world um i'm not sure how you come to that conclusion right i'm um, not you didn't well, miss that part about this because normally whenever I debate creationists, they say that what is responsible for the different layers and the ordering of the fossils is Noah's flood. Um, are you guys in that camp or do you just say that it could have been like God created these layers and these fossils in these layers just at the time of creation? Or do you do you fall into any camp? Well, I wouldn't know, you know, from what paradigm to interpret something I have no access to. So I probably wouldn't make a claim right off the bat about something that the, the very, um, the very participation of which is, is, um, I would, I would have to understand what the hell they're doing in the first place. Like, what do they even mean by it? What's assumed? Are there any, are there are any assumptions? Obviously you and Eva are probably not going to question some of the assumptions, but when, when I got it, would get into it, I would, I would ask, if there were some fundamental assumptions that I can challenge like about what, are the, the, what would the assumptions be? I don't know. Like their methodology, uh, their, their starting assumptions, you know, the same problem with the camel world, right? Is, are, is there a similar, is there a similarity in an assumption? And then when you dig in, um, you just start naming the things consistent with your existing, uh, starting point. Like you just fit it into the narrative. Like if that was happening, I would, 
I would look into see if that was happening. But then there's just problems um, that I would look into as far as dating methodology itself, right? I would, that's why I ask, what's the margin of error? You know, people people have told me certain dating <clears throat> methodologies have a margin of error of two to three million years. So and I'm like, here, okay. here's an instance. Um, this is not uranium lead dating, but um, I think think maybe this was potassium argon it was some sort of igneous dating but they dated the eruption of mount vesuvius at pompeii and they dated it to within about 15 years of its actual historical date did they test that with a bunch of other things because you know i've seen i forgot what article it was they they used the dating method and they thought they found like you know a, a mil you know like some crazy like you know um 200 year old like item and it happens to be like from the 70s or something so it's like you could take one event and go look they nailed it i couldn't comment on that specifically since i'm not familiar with that example but you could point to something like the ulubarun shipwreck which was a bronze age shipwreck that was dated three different methods that all converged on the same date it was dated radiometrically with the wood of the ship it was dated with the tree rings from that wood and they got the same date and then it was dated based on its cargo because it had the uh, certain scarabs from certain pharaohs, so we knew and that they had to have had, after those pharaohs. And, and how did they converge on the same date? Yeah, but they have a they have something to reference as far as declaring it's verified, right? What We're talking about things like historical historical events, right? Where you go recent enough, where you get enough raw rich data through the method where you can but you can you can actually corroborate it with known history of the thing you're looking at well mm -hmm. i guess what i'm asking is if you go back far enough in time and you don't have anything to reference what are you actually referencing in that case to know if it's accurate or not well for certain instances you know the starting conditions like with zircon crystals we know zir how zircon crystals form we can watch them form today we can make them in labs we know that there is there cannot yeah, be that's what i'm life. saying yeah they already have the date that's the no, that's the problem with that have. example <laughs> well these <laughs> things your examples is things historically where you have a general uh track back in historicity oh, so yeah, you have yeah. access to some reference so that, the point is we're, like we're checking to see if this radiometric dating is actually working by comparing it to things with known dates and seeing it does match right does yeah but all, but but the thing is what i would say is known dates or very recent relatively recent dates give you richer um data richer material right so it, you could say anything that's uh more recent has a better sample set right to to work with right wouldn't you agree i mean how how could that not be the case um okay i mean so the accurate wouldn't oh. it, wouldn't you argue that the accuracy of a dating method would actually increase the more recent the subject is no it depends on the method like some dating methods you, like you cannot do for really recent stuff like it doesn't work because not enough daughter isotope has accumulated yet for you to be able to even use radiometric dating on it they're too recent so you need a, a each radiometric dating method has its own range where it works best at and so you have to know which, which you have to apply the method correctly to get correct results if you use a method incorrectly you can expect wrong results okay uh evo do you have anything more uh sorry the most of the chat um weren't directed toward you but you if there's one that uh piqued your interest you're more than willing to respond to it if you remembered it not from the chat no we can just keep going okay uh posh or evo we the other corners of the screen uh you're welcome to take the floor a little bit i'm going to go until three tops which is 20 minutes from now so you guys can take the floor i've been talking quite a bit um, okay, want to let a, um, oh there's dr dino the man himself the guy the guy you reviewed yeah maybe he's going to fight with you evo you're making, he's going to say, you're making us look bad. Some of your objections. Um, you guys want that? It's up to you guys. I like Doc, yeah. Yeah, if he wants uh, to address my video, I don't know if he's seen it. Um, okay, Posh. I'm not sure if in 20 minutes we can accomplish that. I'd like to uh, talk with you more about his uh, four premises. Right. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, we get, yeah. Let's get them on, and we're gonna talk about your four premises, and not we'll we'll come back to it. We'll have another Evo panel, Doctor, okay. um, and we'll do um, your specialized field. Um, so let's bring this up, and uh, that Doctor, was the kind I just pointing thing. I wasn't able to, you know, come on to talk about what I wanted to talk about. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, it I didn't. I didn't know if it was going to be just this video and I, I honestly rather not watch a video with four people and talk about it. I'd rather just what get into it. Yeah. Well, yeah, what did because you want? My, my points were more based on these four premises. Cause like, obviously, uh, you know, I'm listening to the back and forth between you and Jim Bob and you sound very knowledgeable and I agree with you on all of the like empirical findings that you're talking about. But the, but the problem is that the questions that the other side have, like there's a disconnect between the answers that you're giving and the questions that are being asked. And so that's why I made the video because I wanted to directly address the actual concerns of the other side, if that makes sense. Right. Well, here's Dr. Dino and Evo and Dr. Uh, go at it. Uh, howdy. Sorry. Howdy. I'm, I'm a few seconds behind. Uh, Evo, you want to finish what you were talking about and I can talk dating methods after that? Oh, I, I, I just finished. Go, go ahead. Did you see the video, by the way? Oh, uh, no, I did not. I, I just came from the chat to hear. Okay. So, like I said, I'm a bit behind. So, well, go ahead. Uh, it's a it video that's analyzing your um, exchange with Jim Bob from a few days ago. So, yeah, why don't, Evo, why don't you just summarize it quick? Uh, go through it, uh, your, your points to Doctor here. Sure. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. I, I asserted that on a theoretical basis, we can have a theoretical understanding of evolution that is pre-empirical, right? So if you have the four conditions of variance, inheritance, competition, and selection, those are all the ingredients you need to predict basically microevolution. And so the point of my video, as I explained later, was basically, if you accept microevolution, it's not really tenable to also deny macroevolution. That was kind of like the broader point that I was making, but it was on, an, uh, on a, a pre-empirical basis, if that makes sense. That's fair, and that sounds about right to me. I will acknowledge my last appearance here wasn't my best work, so apologize for any missteps I may have made. Uh, with that said, uh, talking about dating methods. So there are a bunch we can use. Uh, some of the most common, or at least commonly known, are carbon-14, uranium lead, and potassium argon. Uh, Jim, do you know the basics of how these are supposed to work? Uh, no. Just say no for the chat's sake and my own sake. Okay. So when crystals, I'll just go with uranium lead dating because it's the easiest. When a crystal called a zircon is formed, it lets in uranium atoms, but it does not in let in lead atoms. We know this because we've made millions of zircons in the lab, and they never let in traceable amounts of lead but they do let in uranium. And once it's in there, it's pretty much locked into the zircon crystal. And the only way it can get out to is if the crystal is deformed, which we can see in a microscope. Like, we can see it very easily. And as time goes on, the uranium decays into lead and some other, some other atoms, but at the end, it's lead. So if we dig up a rock and isolate the crystals, we can measure the proportion of uranium to lead. And since we know the rate that the uranium decays, use that to calculate the age of the rock. OK, I have a question just on that part. Um, how would you sure. determine whether on a long period of time that there's an increase or de decrease rate? Like, how would you know? Well, if the if there could be an increased rapid rate or a decreased rate that's also um you know stark you know like abrupt over the span of time that you're assuming to have uh you know like the dates on so that's a good question and the way we can measure that is by comparing the age we get from uranium lead dating against other dating methods Right, but then I would just ask the same question the other dating methods. Like, the rate that you can observe locally over a long period of time, how would you remove the variable of rapid decay or uh, super 
abrupt slow of decay or some variation of the two over time, depending on what, I don't know, some other variables. Um, I'm asking how would you determine um, whether or not you're, you're accounting for that to happen? Do you just have to assume that it doesn't happen, that the rates always remain the same, similar to what you're observing locally versus over long spans of time? All right. So two different things. First, um, when it comes to radioactive decay chains, there's a lot of different atoms that decay, and they decay in different ways. It would be highly unlikely for one stimulus to affect the decay chains of two different atoms in the same way. The second way we know that they don't really change is we have tried. If we could speed up radiometric decay, it would vastly increase the efficiency of nuclear reactors, which would be phenomenal for energy. everyone, really. Yeah. Uh, it, way is this, and way this is facetious, sorry to interrupt, but is it relatively true that you would date the fossil by the layer and then the layer by the fossil? You're just kind of doing a, just date them both? And one informs the date of the other? Not really. No, that is that, a simplification that is perpetuated by creationists. Okay. And so but let's okay, let's go stick on. You can go on. Sure. K, sure. Okay. So that's how we know it doesn't really change because we have tried every way we can fig we can think of. And I think there are some studies that manage to shift the rate of decay by uh, Grace, and you might have read about this before, like yeah, point point five percent. It's incredibly high pressures or temperatures you you can accelerate nuclear decay. But again, it, the, enough temperatures and pressure to destroy all life on Earth if it actually happened in our past. Like if mm -hmm. these nuclear decay rates were accelerated in the past, the amount of heat and radiation that would be released would literally wipe out all life on Earth and melt the crust. Yep, and that's the other important thing. Radiometric decay releases heat. And over a large enough time, a lot of heat. In order for some of the oldest rocks on Earth to have undergone the amount of decay we see in the rock, if that had happened within, say, 6,000 years, the planet would be a miniature star from the amount of heat. Like, the crust would be molten, the seas would have boiled away, there wouldn't be any life on Earth if they had been sped up. Okay, based on the the dating being accurate. Just no. based on the decay that's present and how much heat they release. Right. <laughs> but doesn't that make an assumption about what's present in the past, though? <clears throat> well, like the amount... Over. He already the amount of it. You can know that there wasn't any initial daughter elements in things like zircons. We can also do isochron dating, which makes <laughs> absolutely no assumptions about the initial conditions. Like there are different radiometric dating where you have varying degrees of in starting initial assumptions from mm -hmm. zero assumptions to very, very well informed assumptions, like with lead dating, where you literally cannot have lead in the initial formation of zircon crystals. Yeah. We've tried. Uh, again, we've made tons of zircon <laughs> crystals in the lab, and every time, no lead. And we've observed them forming in nature, too. No lead. Yep. We can just pick it out of a lava flow, let it cool, zircons, bam. Nothing. Okay. And what's the entailment of that? The... So that means that when the, when the crystals are formed, there is only uranium and no lead. But after we give them time for the radiometric decay to occur, some of the lead, some of the uranium will be replaced by lead. Okay, and then what's the entailment of that? I mean, I'm trying to understand what the what uh, what the is the story of reality that you're the crafting out. The entailment is that today, when we look at zircon crystals, we find appreciable amounts of lead in them. And that lead could not have been there at its formation. And it is not like the, the crystal itself is still has integrity, meaning it wasn't contamination. So that lead must necessarily have come 
from radioactive nuclear decay, which yep. could not have been accelerated because it would have melted the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like wanna address so you're saying really that quick. lead. It sounds like you're saying just to give it back to you that that finding lead in crystals, um, based on your systems of dating, that I'm not sure how you know the the um, I don't know how you know the margin of error, right? Because I want to ask one margin of error. Oh, you say, yeah. well, we look at the other one. And I go, how do you know the margin of error? It seems to just go to another dating process. And I'm asking, like, what's the margin of error, okay? So put that aside. It sounds like you're saying crystals have lead in them, right? And there's no, the only way there's lead in them is if X is true. And if X wasn't true, the, the earth would be melted. That's kind of what I'm getting, right? Mm-hmm. It's called the heat problem. It's a big issue with creationism. Well, it's one of the heat problems. But um, so a couple things, there were a couple things there you said, uh, like the margin of error. I do want to address that. But first, uh, there's just something I've been seeing in the chat I do want to address. I agree that dating methods aren't a valid reason to give up your faith in Christianity. This is not an argument against Christianity, and there are quite a few Christians who accept what science says and still have their faith. Like, this isn't an issue for most people. Now, with that said, <coughs> uh, the uncertainty in dating methods is mostly down to the sensitivity of the instruments used to measure them. Uh, we usually use mass spectrometers, though there are other methods, and some machines are more sensitive than others. And if we just want to stick with uranium lead dating, the margin of error is about 5%, depending on, again, the sensitivity of the machine. More sensitive, less error there is. And we can confirm this by sending the same samples to dozens of labs, and they all get the same answer within the margin of error. Using the same method. Yes, or different yeah, that, Well, the question is, how, the ver the margin of error for any given method. So, so again, I don't think that really, that to me, that wasn't satisfactory. Because if I say, what's the margin of error of given method? You say, well, we compare it to this other method. And that other method's, of, that other method's margin of error depends on how good the, the method is, basically. In, in, in a way, you're synonym, synonymously saying the method is as good as the the technology, but the technology is telling us something that's being interpreted. I'm asking you, who, not what what methodology has the best technology or the most um, sensitive technology. I'm asking the interpretation of the data of that technology is what's in question. And so, um, right. when I ask the margin of error, and it goes and it pushes over to another. Uh, method. I'm going to ask, well, what's the margin of error of that? And then you, again, you push to another method and then you're kind of appealing to tech, right? You're saying sensitivity, but, but that doesn't tell so, me, that tells me the ability to measure something directly locally. I'm saying, what's the margin of error in the conclusions given the me the methods that you're comparing? So, let, all right. So let me put it to you this way. Radiometric dating was first uh, put into practice, I believe, in the early 1900s. And uh, when that was done, we radiometrically dated... Sorry, some weird noise outside my apartment. Uh, we would have dated layer X to 100 million years, plus or minus 20. In the 50s, we, tried it, we would try it again and get 100 million years, plus or minus 10. 2000s, plus or minus 5. Nowadays, maybe plus or minus two. So we keep getting the same ages for a certain layer. We're just getting more zeroed in. And there are different methods we use to date rock layers. And 99.9% .9 of the time, they agree with one another. Not just radiometric decay. Uh, I actually do have an example, if you're interested. 
Uh, let me read this super chat Logan Daly twenty dollars. The crystals cannot form with lead. The crystals do form with uranium. Uranium decays into lead. Uranium's decay rate is constant. I see y'all's thought process here, but it still assumes every universal constant is constant. Now, is it true that crystals can form with uranium? Uranium, and if the uranium can decay, it could actually show up later in time as a lead deposit. That is what happens. Yeah. Can I address that super chat real quick? Yeah. Because the decay rates, like the half lives for these various elements, are determined from more fundamental quantum physics, right? So, yeah, there are constants in those equations, like Planck's constant or things. But again, you don't just assume that those things are constant, those things are constant every time they've ever been measured. Like it's it's not just that you're just assuming they have to be constant. It's that there has never been any example to the contrary ever. Mm -hmm. And if right. they were different in the past, mm -hmm. but you would this, have to assume everything this, that they but, they tie got into would be different as well. I know, but here's to not the thing: have the world be a sun. Here's the thing, though. The another question I had, I think it was to you, is that how do you know that the rates don't change with the given? set of conditions back, back, back in time where you don't have any access or whatever. And you said, that's a good question. But if, if what Logan's saying is true is that if you argue, well, no, lead can't be deposited, right? That proves, you know, if that was the case, um, this would be the consequence. And we go, okay. But then if, if two things are possible, one, the rates could be drastically different from the ones you're apparently, um, discovering and, and measuring with your, your tools, if those, if those could fluctuate to a point where you, you just don't observe it, but it's logically and practically possible, combined with uranium being uh, already existing within the crystal, right? The combination of some drastic variation of decay with the fact that uranium could decay into lead, it seems to be like you'd have to hold to some assumption that no other variables are in play to come to your conclusions. Right. So I... I hear what you're saying. Um, okay. So, like we mentioned earlier, an important thing to keep in mind is that radiometric decay releases heat. If you want to speed up the decay, it's going to release more heat unless you want to say that maybe the connection between decay and heat would have been different in the past. But we have no reason to think that. For well, several reasons. Okay, the first but... being that... The first being that radiometric decay can damage the crystal. And we can measure the amount of energy given off. We know the threshold of what energy would we would need to break the crystal. So let's say we double the rate of decay. We'd find a lot more busted crystals from the decay. And again, it releases heat. That heat affects surrounding crystals and surrounding rock layers. We would see them being melted or metamorphosed. Uh, well, no, and we I understand, not. but you're you, this is the problem with the question that that you're not really answering. And I I don't know if maybe uh, Evo is kind of noticing this because it's the same problem with um, what he's been pointing out this whole time is that the way you're summarizing what would have, should have, could have happened is based on the knowledge you have, the, but the knowledge you have is the thing that's in question. So you're just going, well, no, that wouldn't be the case because if that was the case, then everything that's in question right that, now that, I, that uh, I'm assuming that you're questioning wouldn't be jive well with that that time, that the thing you're trying to uh, describe in the past. So it seems to be like, the, the, again, we'll go in a circle forever because... Um, which Evo Colossus predicted, which is that your starting assumptions of what, how things are, right, in regards to decay, crystals, uranium, lead, heat, this problem, assumes that whatever the constants are now that you're dealing with are the same then, yet you're referring back to a completely different, from your view, a different world right um All even right. base theory's recent video described an alien world where everything we thought was lawful and constant to the rate that they are now is completely different seasons sun exposure cold heat fluctuations all this stuff so do we have full so, access to those things and their influence on the the subject now you don't you have to assume well i'm gonna just assume you do you, do. you have access to the way yes. in which the things were then 
Yes, because the speed of How? light is a constant, and you can look at very far away things, and you can determine what Planck's constant is for those. What are the quantum mechanical constants of nature that How are the that... Of determining radioactive decay rate? And you can see that they're the same in those very distant, very far in the past areas. How does that? No, no. How does that give you saying the speed of light is the same, by the way, across time by measuring it one way um, or or uh, two way? How does that give you the local environment of a of a given uh, planet, right? Millions of years ago, I don't, I don't understand. How you're making that jump of light, you're not looking knowing, at, you're knowing not looking light constant lo equal, right? You're not yeah. looking at this locality. You're looking into the deep past and distant areas, and you're seeing that deeply into the past, all those quantum mechanical constants are the same as today. I, you're looking into the past. That's what you're doing when you're looking out at the stars. Yes. Are you? Yes. Okay. So yeah. if I if Can I see an ex hold on if I see an explosion, um, <clears throat> as far away as possible where I can still see it with like the best like telescope, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now <clears throat> the people locally are experiencing the direct explosion, and I'm experiencing the same explosion very very far away. Am I witnessing the past or am I witnessing the present taking a while to to get to me? You're witnessing the past taking a while to get to you. The past, so, okay. So I'm watching the past in the present. Yeah. Okay, so you think I can watch the past in the present? You absolutely can. When you look at a star, that's what you're seeing. Like, even when you look at the sun, am that I... was the sun, that was what the sun looked like eight minutes ago. Yeah, you're doing it now. Like everything you see happen, is, no, even if it's just pika seconds in the past. I'm well. Am I am I seeing the past or a representation of of something that's occurring? Both. I'm not looking. I'm not looking into the past. Those are not mutually exclusive. There's there's a medium carrying information, right? I'm not witnessing what's actually happening in the past. I'm, w I'm watching a representation of it. When you look at the sun, that's what the sun looked like eight minutes ago. If right now, if the sun just completely disappeared, you would still be looking at it for the next eight minutes, even though in the present it's gone. To me, it's, uh, saying that, that it's a, a past and present difference is just saying that you're further away experiencing the same presence, just at a different effect. I wouldn't call it the past, though. It's like you're seeing the same phenomenon happening. You're just... Okay, so wait, 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 wait. I just don't want to expose the absurdity of this. If I have a picture from the year 1940, am I not looking at a picture from the past because that picture exists right now in the present and I'm looking at it in the present? You're not, you're not observing the past directly, no. Not from a picture from 1940. That's not an observation of the past. No, that's a, that's a piece of representation of the past, but it's not the past. It's not the identical to the past. No, that's but just you a, are it's like a souvenir. What the past looked like in its limited frame of a of yes. a photo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's what the point is. When you look at very distant objects, you are looking at a little photo or whatever of what the past looks like. You're looking at a snapshot. You're not actually in the past. You're just looking at it as like you can see how those. Uh, like molecules are behaving in the past you're seeing that behavior now in the present and you can see based on those interactions that the constants of physics were the same every constant of physics is the same just because light's the same it's not just because light's the same it's because the actual measurable qualities of things like the cosmic microwave background or distant supernovas or different spectrums necess necessitate that certain constants were the same like Planck's constant, for example. Here. Um, um, I would like to say something really quick. So, what is asserted without evidence can be disregarded without... But how's the saying go, Grayson? <laughs> what is asserted, what is without, asserted evidence? Without, without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. It's like a Hitchin, yes. it's Hitchin's razor. You, it's yeah, retarded. You can you you can't I mean, you know there's no there's no valid. evidence do we reject our mind because we there's no evidence of it but, what retarded. i'm saying is you can say that physics may have been different in the past but until you have evidence to show it we have no reason to accept it so we are telling you 
as an example, how radiometric decay works, how it appears to work now, and how all the evidence says it worked in the past. If you want to assert that physics were different in the past, you need evidence of it. Otherwise, we can just dismiss it. Yeah, you know, like, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say physics. The claim that physics could be different in the past is different than um, physics being the same, but f uh, different variables enhancing things that, that are effects. That's not inconsistent okay. to say, like what is physics general has occurred. I'm just saying, is it possible? It's it's a Usually, hypothetical. For me to believe something, I require a reason or evidence to do so. So if you're asserting that physics was different in the past, I need a reason or evidence to think that that was the case. Okay, and you're saying that physics, that I'm not saying physics. Again, you just misrepresented what I'm talking saying. talking about I'm, the constants. That's what I mean by I'm physics. saying the effects locally of a given uh, place, right? That that phys all the physics could be the same and then different variables can impact locally what's happening. In this case, we're talking about um, the <clears throat> increased or decreased rate of decay in a given object, right? I'm saying, is it, it's not logically or practically impossible that the decay rates back in time, right, in a local setting, right, could be enhanced or decreased given some other variables. I'm just saying, I'm just asking, is that possible? Yeah, it's not, it's not impossible that there's a giant pink elephant constantly no, behind no, my head. No, that's not, like, don't, don't do that. Don't do but that. But I know, uh, the thing is, right, is I need I'm gonna, evidence to support. I'm going to ask the other, I'm going to mute you because it's just, it's just bad faith. Evo I mean, or doctor, is it? No, no, this isn't a, this isn't a philosophical whether some entity doesn't exist. Based on the laws of physics, right? Based on, based on the thing you're appealing to. We're not talking about imaginary entities. We're talking about laws that you're appealing to regarding the age of things and the rate of decay of things. I said, is it logically possible and practically that the rates in a previous era could be different than they are now for whatever reason? Is it possible? Sorry, give me just a second. It's logically possible, yes. Is it practically possible? It's, it's, it's also logically possible that the sun won't come up tomorrow. That's true. My point was simply that just because something is possible doesn't mean that there's evidence to believe that is the case. Okay, so you're saying that you have evidence, you, from your view, the evidence and data you have access to leads you to believe that radioactive decay is the same for any given era in time yeah. s since the beginning of the universe. All right. Yeah, because okay. the constants of physics are also the same observably at different points in the past. And the and, radioactive decay yeah. rates are based on those fundamental physical constants in quantum mechanics. Yep, and okay. uh, my answer is I put a red Lamborghini in my closet 50 years ago. The laws of physics were just different back then. It allowed me to get a car into my closet. Prove me 50 wrong. years ago? That the laws yes. of physics just 50 years ago? Yeah, just well, well, in the vicinity of my apartment. Uh huh. What? That's what you're. You see why this is a worthless argument? What do you mean? Why? How is that relative to a past you can't observe in any possible way uh, locally? Whereas, yeah, you, know, you there, cannot we can, observe other my people. Fifty years well, ago. I know, but other people can uh, can basically corroborate Lamborghinis, the type of Lamborghini. We can track back when you purchased it. We can do all sorts of investigation with that example. The point, Jim Bob. And you said 50 you years cannot, ago? Yeah, you cannot okay. disprove that that happened and the laws of physics were not different in my apartment back then. I could just ask you what model of Lamborghini, and if you don't know, I can just not believe you. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not good with cars. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> you, me saying that the laws of physics were just different in a spot in the, some point in the past without any I, evidence I get, is exactly I didn't say what that. you are doing. I didn't say that. I said the variables. Saying, no, no. Listen to me. You, you guys are just deliberately misinterpreting what I'm saying. Can the laws of physics maintain, right? And different variables can influence an effect you're talking about. 
Okay, uh, the variable is really quick. Years ago. It's, it's been over three hours. Okay. I'm going to have to go. But Jim Bob, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Posh, Posh I will debate you anytime just because I like listening to your voice. And it was good to meet you. Uh, and, and thanks, Evo and Doc, for joining too. I'm going to hop off. Thanks, guys. I think, yeah, I've, I've, because I'm not engaging with the material as often, you know, I, I've forgotten quite a bit about the examples I would have given. So. Right. It's rather unfortunate that we came from philosophy and it ended yeah. up being this, although it was fun. It, just, it was, yeah. I'm sorry um, I haven't contributed as much as I'd like to have. I just wasn't, I, the one thing I really wasn't, I, honestly, some of the technical, technical stuff was outside of my wheelhouse, 